to educate and increase and uh, religious people. And uh, they've done like land owners and rich people, they give lands or places for the for the training the priests. And then uh, uh, you guys are growing up for that. Currently, um, I think just one day ago, we, we were uh, voted again uh, first first university. I think they got the time. I know most of you are over here as well, but yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was around 247 Nobel Prizes in Oxford. Um, and our niece, president of the UK, uh, um, she uh, graduated from Oxford as well. Unfortunately, um, uh, the, the next one is graduated from Oxford as well. <laughs> okay, um, uh, this is, uh, I think, all the things speaking in Russian world. I don't know And um, we've got around 39 colleges. Colleges are like small places, which they got, uh, they are different than university. Uh, they are still running to university. Uh, they are, um, in some sense, they are free, but um, um, when you uh, register with the university, you have to register with the colleges at the same time. Colleges like pastoral, pastoral with other students. Then you register with the big university, uh, you've got your tutors and support from the colleges. Uh, in the UK, we've got two universities using college gate system, Oxford at, and Cambridge. Um, obviously, Cambridge is 100 years later from Oxford. I just want to mention that over here. Um, and currently, I think we've got around 11,000 undergraduate and 7,000 postgraduate students. It's very uh, research university, research-based university. We've got very little undergraduate uh, students. Um, but Oxford Brooks is very teaching university, let's say. Generally, uh, every city has got around two universities, one teaching, one research. Um, these are some fancy pictures around Oxford. If you've got time today, we can have a kind of like walking tour as well. We can show some of the colleges. Uh, if, you, if you're going to stay in Oxford today, then tomorrow we can do a kind of quick tour as well around Oxford. Um, I just mentioned about St. Luke Chapels, I think. Um, and um, now I'm going to just quickly um, go through the program, which we are quite late a bit. Uh, but we're going um, uh, to start with Dr. Apte uh, um, we're going to start with Professor Sack. Uh, but uh, Dr. Aptek is going to do a welcome speech first, and then Professor Sachs is going to do uh, a TMS overview. Um, and after that, we're going to try to present our preliminary results from our pilot study with Dr. Aydin. And after that, uh, around before lunch, I think we're going to probably uh, listen to Dr. Kara. Uh, she's going to talk about EEG scans and what she's doing with us in research. And around one, one quarter of one, we're going to have lunch, and after lunch, we're going to get Dr. Onorahim and Dr. Johnson and their presentation. Um, we've got Professor Mezzigrino. Um, um, he's a professor of anatomy from Italy, and, uh, but he's going to give his uh, perspective on family perspective because he worked with uh, Dr. Arden on his clinic, and he's going to uh, talk about how his um, children get benefit from TMS. And after that, we've got uh, Dr. Dadukun and Dr. Mauro. They're going to um, demonstrate us um, their fancy devices on uh, dry QEG. And probably we're going to see some demonstration um, on, on that as well. And they're going to do some presentation as well. And um, um, we are quite flexible with the time. Don't worry about like half past three or four. If you get trained, you can leave any time you want. But we try to finish probably around five because we get a bit late today. And um, yeah, is there anyone have got any question about the program? If not, then I'm gonna welcome Dr. Aydin for for his uh, welcome speech. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you all to come in here. As you know, Cosmos Healthcare, we have been collaborating with Oxford and Maastricht universities on our QEG guided uh, RTMS and TDCS research. Um, so far, uh, we will talk about it later on today, a lot about it. I just want to give brief information about our company. 
So the Cosmos Healthcare providing psychological and psychiatric services, including depression and anxiety treatment through RTMS and uh, cognitive behavioral therapies. And we also have uh, substance misuse, uh, gambling, problematic gambling and alcohol issues uh, through, again, combination of TMS and uh, bioresonance. So far, we've been also working on the, as you know, the research for the children, uh, ADHD, autism, and learning difficulties. As a Cosmos Healthcare, we are really proud to be here, collaboration with the big two universities, and, and our research is going and growing uh, every day, more and more. So today, um, I would like to first welcome uh, Professor Alexander Sack from Maastricht University, and I would like him to give us some information, literature information regarding the TMS. Yes, I will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Aptekin uh, and uh, the organizers for inviting me and for organizing this, uh, this very interesting and important event to raise awareness for the field of non-invasive brain stimulation. Very happy to be here and to talk for around 45 minutes about um, some of the basics and some of the concepts that, that we will hopefully dive in. Just to lay a bit the foundation of what we are talking about, how it works and um, what, what we could do with these new technologies um, to modulate, to stimulate the human brain. So my name is indeed Alexander Zack. I'm a professor of brain stimulation um, and uh, applied cognitive neuroscience at Maastricht University and I'm also the director of the depression TMS clinic at the Maastricht Academic Hospital. I titled my talk, unlike uh, in the program, a bit non-invasive brain stimulation, what, how, when and why, because I thought um, not knowing the background of this heterogeneous audience that it might be good to tell you a bit what non-invasive brain stimulation is, how it works, when you can use it and why you should maybe use it in clinical context. Here for your information, my declaration of conflict of interest. And this is where I'm coming from. This is where I work. This is Maastricht University. Uh, we have a very nice setup, um, I think at least, which is uh, the so-called health campus. Uh, and it's a very close interaction of colleagues focusing on basic brain research. So trying to understand how the human brain works, develop new technologies to improve um, human brain function and to understand the relationship between brain and behavior. And this is done in these uh, fundamental neuroscience departments. But we also then directly translate our findings and methodological and technological developments into clinical practice in the academic hospital, which is directly linked to the uh, basic research uh, facilities. And we have applications in the field of psychiatry, neurology, and rehabilitation. And I will talk a little bit about those. There are many methods and technologies out there to stimulate the brain. And, uh, Strictly speaking, you can divide them into invasive technologies. These are the deep brain stimulation operations or neural implants. So you have to really undergo surgery. And they, have been, they are used in clinical practice in our hospital as well for Parkinson's disease, for example, very successful uh, deep brain stimulation operations are taking place. But you also have non-invasive neuromodulation, which is my speciality and my passion because I believe that in the last 10 years, the technological development has put us to a point where we can achieve a lot of very meaningful results using non-invasive uh, uh, brain stimulation. And non-invasive means literally that uh, you don't have to undergo surgery. Uh, we can do this in an, in an ambulant setting. Uh, and therefore, all of these technologies, there are various techniques that fall under the umbrella term of being non-invasive. They all have in common that they are transcranial. So whenever you read something is transcranial, it, it means it's non-invasive because it literally indicates that we are doing something on the outside of the intact skull and we apply, for example, magnetic fields or electric current on the outside that can then transcranially, so through the intact skull, 
have effects on neural activity, on brain activity. And that's what makes them non-invasive. And the two most important technologies we have now available is TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So again, transcranial because we are coming from the outside through the intact skull. And here's, here in this technology, we use very strong magnetic fields to induce uh, activity in the underlying neural tissue. And we have TDCS, which stands for transcranial direct current stimulation, uh, which uses electric current, very low intensity electric current running between electrodes that you place on the outside of the head. And also this low intensity current flowing between the electrodes can have effects, neurophysiological effects on the brain tissue underneath the, the skull. I'll talk a bit about TMS first, very, very basic, just to ha get you um, uh, into the position that you have a, bit a, a better understanding of how, how it works. These are two examples of available TMS systems. They all do, in principle, the same thing. So you need a stimulator, which uh, can produce a, a very strong electric current, very, very strong. And this is then discharged through a cable into a so-called TMS coil which in essence is an electromagnetic coil. And this coil you can place on the outside of your patient's head. And by doing so, you send the electric current through this coil. And because it's a moving current, it creates a strong magnetic field. And because it's not a static magnetic field, but a magnetic field that builds up very rapidly over time, and that decays again, it's a changing magnetic field. And because of the law of electromagnetic induction, if you're exposed to a changing magnetic field, anything that's conductible, and the brain is conductible because the brain communicates with electricity, that's the language of the brain. Neurons, brain cells communicate with each other using electricity. Because of this changing magnetic field that we apply, these pulses, these magnetic pulses, we can induce electric activity in the brain. This is what you see here. The TMS pulse is placed just outside, touching the head. We send very strong magnetic pulses transcranially through the intact skull into the brain. And these changing magnetic fields will induce electricity in the underlying uh, brain, make this brain uh, area active, make these neurons fire. Yeah. You see here uh, an example of, um, of, this, uh, of this concept. And I don't know whether the movie starts. Yes, this is a PhD student of mine many years ago, and it's just for demonstration purposes. I put her into an fMRI scanner, which is a machine that can measure brain activity. There was nothing to do with stimulation. I want to measure the activity in her brain. And I do that while she's doing a very simple task. I just ask her to tap her right index finger. And while she does that, I'm measuring with this fMRI scanner her brain activity. And I can analyze her data. So this is her brain. This is her head. And in her brain, you see this activity area in orange. And this is exactly the area that is activated in her brain when she's moving her finger. It's a very simple brain imaging assessment. Now I know which area in her brain is activated by herself by voluntarily moving her finger. Now you see me with a TMS coil in my hand placed using a neural navigation software that tells me exactly where is my magnetic pulse now hitting her brain. And I'm trying to navigate exactly to that area in her brain. And she's just sitting there, not doing anything. And I'm now applying a TMS pulse to that area. And what you see happens, I make her finger move. She doesn't want to move her finger. I make her finger move because I'm activating exactly this area that I know in her brain is the area that is active when she's voluntarily moving her finger. So if I move, activate this area, her finger moves. That demonstrates the, the principle of TMS. So you can stimulate, instantaneously you can stimulate brain activity. But you can do a lot of, lot of things, actually, with TMS, because you can use different parameters. And this is an example where we try to do the opposite. We try to actually disrupt, we stop brain activity. 
while somebody is trying to do something. You see here a little clip, and I think it was filmed in London, um, where a journalist made a big mistake to visit a TMS lab to find out how it works. And a colleague of mine, Vincent Walsh, um, placed the TMS coil above his speech area, his speech production area. And while this journalist was speaking, the TMS pulses were applied to his speech area to disrupt this process. I'm Roger Eichel. I'm the science editor of the Daily Telegraph. Now, words mean everything to me, but now I'm going to have the speech area of my brain turned on to the giant outfit. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a little trouble. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All of these horses and all of these men couldn't have come to together again. So you see what happens? He's trying to speak. His brain needs to activate his speech production area, Broca's area. And when we stimulate with certain parameters that area, and we can disturb this function, we actually induce a speech arrest. And you could also see something else. This journalist apparently was surprised himself that he couldn't speak anymore. He was laughing. So TMS is relatively side effect, um, has, has very little side effects. It's uh, depending again on the parameters, it's, it's, uh, it's painless. Um, and, and safe, safe to be used. But there's something else to say about TMS which is probably most interesting for most of you because we use it already for 25 years in Maastricht as a research tool. So not for clinical purposes, but as a research tool because it's a great way to, to zap the brain and have instantaneous effects on behavior. So it tells us a lot about what is the functional role of this area? Because not only do I measure it, but I actually change it and I can see how behavior changes. You cannot speak, other people have changes in memory and so forth. So it's a per perfect research tool and we use that a lot still until today. But there's one thing you can do with TMS which opened many years ago already this extremely promising journey that we are all part of now um, that, that is the foundation of the clinical potential of this, uh, this brain stimulation technology. And that is that we know now, based on animal research and even based on in vitro research, so in Maastricht we have a research line where we stimulate not, not humans, but neuro, neuro, neural cells in a dish, just to see what are the real effects of TMS on cellular level, to understand that better. And from all these research lines, we know now that if you do TMS, not just by applying a few pulses like you've seen here in the movie to make the finger move or to induce a speech arrest, but you apply so-called repetitive TMS, which is called RTMS. And that means you apply not just a few pulses, but hundreds or thousands of pulses to an area with a certain frequency, which then becomes a very important parameter, because if you have thousands of pulses, the question is in what, in what rhythm, in what frequency you want to stimulate. We know now that depending on this particular protocol, we actually can trigger and induce neuroplastic changes in the brain. So we are changing the synaptic transmission efficiency. We are modulating how networks communicate, and these plastic changes that we induce, they are outlasting the stimulation. So they have lasting effects. They're not over when I stop the stimulation, but they are, they are persisting. And of course, if you think about this, this of course is then a, a, an extremely powerful tool to treat different disorders that are characterized by a pathological, um, by a pathological um, neural activation pattern that you want to correct in the long term by applying this RTMS protocol. And even better, we now know that there are certain frequencies, certain parameters that lead to either an excitation, an in increase in activity, a long-lasting increase in activity induced by TMS, which is uh, usually uh, termed high-frequency RTMS. But there are also protocols that do the exact opposite, low-frequency protocols, and they are inhibiting um, 
the activity in that area. So by stimulating the same area in the same patient, depending on the parameters you use, you can do both. You can increase or decrease the activation level or with lasting effects. Neuroplastic changes. Now comes then of the obvious um, application. If you have a tool that can induce a neuroplastic change that is lasting, and you can even choose which area you want to modulate, and you can choose whether you want to modulate it in a way that you make it more active or less active, then it's clear if you have a disorder, depression, OCD, ADHD, if you had a disorder that is related to, to a pathological brain pattern where you know which areas you need to activate and you know which areas you need to inhibit, then you have a perfect match of a potential therapeutic tool that you can apply in that context. And that is why TMS now for 20 years has been intensively investigated for being a potential therapy for a large variety of neurological and psychiatric disorders. And by far the most researched example of a successful treatment using this technology, this non-invasive brain simulation technology, is depression. I know that's not the main topic of today, but I still would like to talk a bit about this because it's such a prime example of where we can get with that technology. Depression is by far the biggest problem in the mental health crisis that we are in. 300 million people worldwide suffer from depression. Um, and there are treatments available already for depression, right? We, we don't need neuromodulation to start with because we have no alternative. We have alternatives. Psychotherapy is an effective treatment. Pharmacotherapy is effective. So you have antidepressive drugs. The problem with this is that besides take, putting aside the fact that many people don't want to take medication because they have side effects and they don't want to be uh, dependent on taking medication for the rest of their life. Let's put that aside for now and ignore that problem. Even if they would all be willing and happy to take medication and there would be no side effects, theoretically speaking, more than 30% of those depressed patients are just not responding to the medication. They are not helpful for them. They are so-called treatment-resistant uh, patients. And for those patients, you need an alternative, a non-pharmacological alternative. And one of these patients, our first patient in Maastricht was uh, Haneke. I always talk about Haneke because it was for us such an eye-opener. It was before it was uh, approved and reimbursed. And she reached out because there were already these ideas in the literature that TMS could be an effective treatment for depression. And at one point, we just say, OK, we do it. you can do it in our research labs. We know the protocol. We have the equipment. Just come to us. We'll, we'll give it a try. And it was for me personally also a very um, emotional experience because then you meet a person. You know, normally, you, know, you do research and you look at numbers. This is a person. And, and uh, she's depressed for 15 years. She tried everything. Nothing worked. She comes with her family. Of course, if you're depressed, then this, uh, this affects the entire family, children, grandchildren, and so forth. And uh, Haneke came to us, we, we did a TMS treatment with her, which entailed stimulating her uh, prefrontal cortex uh, daily for 20 minutes for six weeks. That was the standard depression protocol at the time. And um, this is a picture of me and not Haneke, because Haneke didn't want to be in the picture, that's my secretary. Um, but at the end of the six weeks treatment, the, this patient being 15 years chronically depressed was in full remission. So not only did she get better, but she was fully um, free from her depression. And I remember that the whole family visited us. They didn't know how to thank us. They came with wine and chocolate and they looked at me and I said, you don't know what you have done. And that was the beginning of my entire team to even more focus on this, this uh, clinical research line. And what was wrong in Haneke's case and also in many other depressed patients that is the underlying concept why it works is that there are certain areas in the brain, networks, that are pathologically affected by depression. And some of these areas are deep in the brain and we cannot really reach them directly with TMS because we are non-invasive, we are more on the outside, so we are directly targeting more the, the cortical, the neocortex of the brain. But we have two regions, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is called, on the left and the right side of the hemisphere, 
where we can actually have an entry point into that network. So we stimulate these prefrontal areas, not because the depression is located there, that's just silly, but because it gives us a window where the stimulation that we apply prefrontally actually propagates through a network that includes area, uh, deeper lying area in the limbic parts of the brain that are affected by depression. And this is the rationale now um, why a TMS for depression is effective and why it's used. We now have, have gone a long way in the last 20 years. We have new protocols, more powerful protocols, shorter protocols now available. Uh, this is a study in 200 depressed patients we did in the Netherlands, for example, where we even now start to combine the effective TMS treatment with other interventions, like psychotherapy in this case. You can even do it simultaneously. You see a, a psychotherapy session while the patient is also receiving brain stimulation. And we have response and remission rate of over 60%. And these are treatment-resistant patients. So more than half of those patients, of these 200 patients that did not respond to any other form of treatment, more than 60% were after these four, five weeks of treatment uh, fully cured from their depression, they're in remission. And this is uh, the Maastricht TMS Depression Clinic. Just to now jump into 2022, this is not research anymore. Just to make this crystal clear, this is not research anymore. This is not a question, you know, could that work? It's promising. We have to do further research. Um, these are preliminary. This is all not the case. This is established clinical efficacy. This is FDA approved. This is CE approved. Um, this is standard care in our hospital. It's reimbursed by public health insurances. Just to make this very, very clear, this is not experimental of label anymore. Depression TMS is working and is a growing number of countries, including the UK, US already since 2008, it's a recognized, approved and reimbursed treatment. Here we see actually the level of evidence. I now talked about depression, but it's not only depression. Uh, you see also uh, that uh, level A, B and C evidence, all three are in a way good, because it means that there's a critical number of scientific placebo controlled studies that have proven that this is actually clinically effective on these three levels of possibly, probably, and definitely. I told you about depression already, where there is no doubt. And also those ones are extremely promising. And the field is dynamically changing so much that these uh, guidelines are updated every couple of years. And you can really see more applications joining, some applications moving up from here to there. Just to give you already a spoiler, you see here OCD as a possibly effective level C. In the Netherlands, we are now running the very last multi-center clinical trial sponsored by the uh, Dutch government to, um, to show for the very last time the already shown clinical efficacy for treating OCD because they are willing to also have this, you know, based on level A evidence then reimbursed by public health insurance. So in the next couple of years, I expect OCD to actually join depression in reimbursement schemes. Just to give you an idea how quick this field is moving. And this was just in the field of psychiatry. This is the level of evidence of TMS in the field of neurology and rehabilitation. You see neuropathic pain. Everything just seems to be delayed by a few years because the time point when, let's say, modern TMS was introduced to the scientific uh, community, actually in the UK in 1985, TDCS followed it five or six years later. Um, so this low intensity TDCS um, modern applications and then also the first clinical trials of TMS in the 1990s, and again TDCS a bit later, so you can have nice parallels between the two technologies. And therefore I would like to also spend a few words on that, uh, that idea. TDCS in many ways is similar, it's again non-invasive, it's transcranial, so again we're working from the outside of the head to achieve stimulation inside the head. But now instead of placing there a coil and, and applying strong magnetic pulses, what we do is we have a a much simpler technology that is literally a battery and you can attach electrodes to this battery, in the most simple case two electrodes, you can also do more. And then you have an, an electrode which is called the anode and the other one is the cathode. And then you place them somewhere on the outside of the head where you want to stimulate and then a low intensity current, a few milliampere, you hardly feel it so it's not painful. 
uh, at a, after a while you actually don't feel anything at all anymore. So you have to look at the device, is it really on? Because it's really absolutely um, no subjective discomfort. And then there's a low intensity current running from the anode to the cathode. And by doing this for a couple of minutes, you actually have similar neurophysiological effects, depolarizing, hyperpolarizing the neural tissue on the route between these, these electrodes. A big difference between TMS and TDCS is that TDCS, if you want, is a more gentle way to stimulate the brain because unlike TMS where you can actually make brain cells fire, so you force them to really fire, which you could see in the, in the finger movement, you know, I, I apply it to the motor cortex and because it's so strong, the TMS, they start to move. TDCS could not do that, but it still does something very similar, namely it's changing, it's changing the threshold of firing of the neurons that I stimulate. A neuron is always ready to fire in your brain because it's getting input from the outside or from the inside. And it's, it's always at a certain, let's say, um, readiness level, which is the resting membrane potential. And in order to get out of this resting membrane potential, you need some energy, you know, from the inside or from the outside. And TDCS applied to that brain cell makes it actually a bit more ready to go or less ready to go by changing this threshold, and again it's electricity in millivolts, by either making the threshold a bit smaller or a bit higher. So you're not directly stimulating the brain, but you make it more um, uh, excitable for stimulation. You make it more ready to go or less ready to go. And because the brain is constantly active and communicating, uh, areas are communicating with each other in networks, this has a very lasting effect on on pain activity similar to TMS. And we know now, again, basic research, we know now that this stimulation has effects on brain activity, on brain networks. It's always about, about brain networks. With these technologies, you can never just uniquely stimulate one area only, but it will always spread along a network. And it has, and that's important, also parameters you can choose where you not just have a, an effect while you stimulate, but you have effects that are lasting. The same story I just told you with TMS, you induce neuroplastic changes that are outlasting the stimulation. You don't want a patient to run around with the electrodes on the head for the rest of their life. You want to do a, a treatment for a couple of weeks where the, the brain is trained to make new connections to change excitability level and the, tr the brain is ready to learn, right? All this is learning, you know, this is long, the synaptic learning, this is what we do. We learn the brain a new trick. We help the brain to learn a new trick by applying um, specific protocols of brain stimulation. And we know that this works. We, we know that it works on a cellular level, on a system level, and it's exactly what TDCS does. So lasting effects, changing neuroplasticity, and I don't want to bore you with these details, but just to make the parallel to TMS again, exactly like with TMS, we also with TDCS have different montages where we could either increase the activity or reactivity, let's say, of this area. We make it more active or we can make it less active. Exactly what I told you with high and low frequency RTMS, you have anodal versus cathodal TDCS. You will read that in research papers and would know if somebody had an anodal TDCS, you know that this was meant to increase the activity. If somebody gets a cathodal TDCS, it would meant to decrease. And depending where you put the electrode, this is the areas that you target. And again, parallel to TMS also there, of course, people first looked into safety. Same take home message, it is safe, it is uh, very few side effects, and in comparison to TMS, it's even safer. It has even less side effects. It's, it's very comfortable, it's very painless, and um, the side effect and risk profile is uh, probably the best you can get when it comes to neurostimulation techniques. And it's also effective in treating depression. Again, already 10 years ago, there were studies using TDCS in depressed patients. This is a study from Australia, from the uh, well-known Black Dog Institute in Sydney. And already 10 years ago, they looked into the same rationale, you know, again, fo fo focusing on the prefrontal cortex, the same area that you would target with TMS, the left prefrontal cortex, that's the depression target in TMS, that is now reimbursed and level A evidence. 
the same idea, anodal TDCS over the left prefrontal cortex to get into that depression network has shown to have um, clinically significant uh, and effective um, improvements in these depressed patients. And again, similar to TMS, also there is a level ABC evidence based on guidelines from the entire scientific literature. And this is uh, from 2021, so just last year, the latest update of indications uh, where TDCS has been shown to be definitely effective. You see again, our friend depression is there. So this is a, um, a level A evidence uh, uh, for TDCS. And again, a list of, of, um, of applications that uh, are probably or possibly effective. And I talked to some colleagues here that successfully use TDCS in their private practice already. And it very much aligns what's described here. So they use it for depression. They use it for, for pain, for fibromyalgia, um, uh, uh, for addiction, uh, and also for ADHD successfully, and I come to this in a, in a, in a second, why, why it's not on that list. So that's a very important slide for me as a personal message, because at least in the Netherlands, where I was involved in negotiating with uh, policymakers and insurances, what do we do with that? You know, we, know it's, we know it works, you know, the, the, there's no question about that. Uh, we know it has better side effects, it's a non-pharmacological alternative. Can we, how can we offer it to our patients and get, get reimbursed? And after a long process of negotiation, it is now, luckily in the Netherlands and many other countries, as I said, it's a growing number of countries, um, it is recognized and reimbursed. But at least in the Netherlands and many other countries, it's only reimbursed after two failed trials. So patients still need to try medication first. It doesn't work, they need to try another medication. It doesn't work, and then they are allowed to get TMS reimbursed. Uh, I personally think it's a shame not to offer it earlier because the response and remission rates we see in those patients, which you see here, this is the response rate, so the percentage of people that are responding to TMS, and those are the percentage of people that are actually in full remission due to the TMS treatment, so they're fully cured. These are the patients that we get following the strict uh, restriction that they have to be treatment resistant, defined as two failed medication. You see how impressive these numbers are compared to just trying another medication, another medication, another medication, which is often still in, psych in psychiatric um, clinics where they're still unaware of TMS. And you would be surprised how many colleagues are still unaware of this alternative to pharmacotherapy even though since 2008 it's FDA approved. You know, this is not yesterday. Still so many colleagues come to our courses and they are astonished by the evidence because they've never heard of it. And here is the actual data showing you how drastically the response and remission rates drop if you just continue to try to help your patient with yet another drug, yet another medication. Not only do they go through a, a painful journey with all the side effects, but also the chances of helping them is really decreasing to an unacceptable low level. And here's what you could get if you would just offer them TMS. And I took the freedom based on own uh, data that we, that we recently um, collected in cooperation with, with Plato uh, Science TDCS uh, headsets, home use TDCS, I come to that in a second, to just place in the response and revision rate of TDCS. And you see it's very similar to TMS uh, and also deserves its position maybe in the landscape of these alternatives. Um, I dream of the day where we can say to our patient, you know, you are depressed. There are various options out there. All of them are effective, psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy, TMS, TDCS, and they can just choose which one to start with based on their personal, you know, idea of what they think is best for them. Are they willing to, to tolerate the side effects of pharmacotherapy? Are they willing to try a couple of those? Do they want to start with TMS right away? I think that would be the right way to position them. Um, just to tell you a little bit that, this, that we're not just only operating on, we try something and we see whether it gets better. We actually have a very con concrete idea of what's happening in the brain when we do TMS. Again, in the context of depression, people like me and others are using fMRI, PET, SPECT, so brain imaging technology to actually visualize and quantify the biological changes that accompany the clinical improvements. 
because you can have clinical improvements for many reasons. Of course, all of this is placebo controlled, so it's not just placebo. But you also want to understand why are getting why are these people getting better? What is really changing in their brain? Is something changing in their brain? So there's lots of data on that as well. Of course, as scientists, we want to know the mechanisms. And just to give a brief overview, there are particular networks involved in depression. We know that are characterized by a, a hypoactivity, which means they are not active enough. And that's areas that are uh, connected to the prefrontal cortex, which is exactly what we do in the therapy. That's why we target it. But there are also areas that are characterized by hyperactivity, which means they are too active, which is the limbic system, anterior cingulate cortex. And the funny thing is these two are, of course, connected. The one is controlling the other. So by tapping into that network, you actually change the balance of communication between the two, and that is doing the trick. I'm probably terrible with time. How, how am I doing with time? Mm -hmm. I have a bit more time? Okay, perfect, yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll try to, uh, yeah, don't be too long. But what we now know, which is great news, is that there seems to be a very particular change in the brain that we want to uh, achieve with our brain stimulation that is very relevant to the question whether somebody is really improving in their depressive symptoms or not. And this seems to be a very particular connection between the prefrontal cortex, the one we're stimulating with TMS, and a region deeper in the, in, the, in the brain, which is called the anterior cingulate cortex or the subgenuine anterior cingulate cortex. So this connectivity seems to be very important because in hindsight, when you look at, you do pre-measurement of brain activity, then you do your TMS treatment, then you do post-measurement of brain activity. In hindsight, you see that those patients that got better were the ones where you successfully modulated the connectivity between these two regions. So that's very interesting, and that brought us uh, in, in Ma at Maastricht University and also others now um, to the idea we can even do better than what we do now. We can, we can start to personalize the brain stimulation treatment. So rather than having a basic idea and then knowing that this works, you know, we, we target this area with this protocol and we do that for everybody, and we have good results. You know, all the results I showed you is based on that idea, you know, one size fits all. 50% response and remission rate. So it's not bad for treatment-resistant population. But of course, the development is moving on. And what we are now trying to achieve is to personalize the protocols. And one idea is to, um, to capitalize on that scientific evidence that we know that there's a certain, um, there, there's a certain connectivity between two concrete areas that we want to change because we know that if, we, if that works, people are getting better. So we do reverse engineering. We start with that connectivity. So we do first an fMRI scan in the patient, and then we identify the, 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 the exact area in the brain, in the prefrontal cortex, that is mostly connected to that ACC region, which is the one that we want to modulate. And then we position the TMS coil on that individually defined spot in every single patient. So it's the best perfect spot that has the best connectivity to that ACC region that we want to get at. So we don't leave it up to chance anymore whether we're successful in modulating it, but that's our starting point now. That's the first step of personalizing it. And the second step of personalizing is something that we uniquely do in Maastricht as a research line is something that I always say uh, because I'm so proud of, and I don't know whether this will lead us somewhere, but the last 15 years we developed a setup which is at the moment still unique in the world which allows us to look at the um, complexity of the brain when we stimulate it with TMS by at the same time assessing with EEG the rhythmic brain activity of our, of our subjects and also with fMRI the network effects of our TMS application. So I showed you already these network effects and now I want to understand whether these network effects that I can induce with TMS how they relate to EEG measured rhythmic brain activity changes. Because that's something I ignored so far in my talk. I talked about networks and TMS and fMRI, but EEG is a, is, a, is a method that can add something to the picture that fMRI is blind to, and that is the temporal structure of the brain activity. An area is never simply active or not. That's not how the brain works. The brain works in rhythmic patterns of activity that you can only pick up with a method like EG that has a good temporal resolution. 
And, and all of your brains right now are rhythmically changing the activity patterns over time from moment to moment. And EG can assess this. And we do that all simultaneously to get a full picture of how these rhythmic activity patterns interact with network effects uh, in the context of brain stimulation. And this is the setup we developed. And the big take home message is that we know now that if we apply TMS to the brain, if we want to get the most optimal network effect, we need to consider this information. We need to align the brain stimulation with particular, at, at, we need to apply the brain stimulation at particular moments of this rhythmic activity assessed by EG. And that's also a personalization that we're working on at the moment. So you could personalize the brain stimulation by having the individual EG data available and you tailor the protocol based on this EEG, that gives you the most robust network effects. And of course, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. What about ADHD and autism? Well, then most of you are here because of this. And I know that we hear a lot about this later on. And there's something I want to make very, very clear is that um, I showed you these level ABC evidences. And ADHD and autism is not among them. That means from a pure scientific point of view, there are in the literature at the moment not enough studies done fulfilling the criteria to make it on that list. Now, what does that mean? And it's very important that I also highlight this in my courses always. It does not mean that it's not wor working, that it's not effective. Because there's also scientific research looking into evidence against efficacy. So if people would have looked into that thoroughly and would have found that it does not work for ADHD autism, I, would, I could present you now evidence, level ABC evidence against efficacy. But I'm not doing that. And that, that has one very important conclusion for you. It means that there's no evidence now that it works and there's no evidence now that it doesn't work. And the reason why it's not on the list is not that there's no scientific studies out there about this. It's just compared to depression and OCD and all the others, there are not large enough trials that are controlled, placebo controlled, that would justify including this in the list. So at the moment, it's a lack of number of patients being reported in scientific literature. And here comes the funny thing. I give PMS courses for 10 years already to psychologists and psychiatrists from all over the world. I have trained hundreds and hundreds of private practitioners in using TMS. And I'm showing this level of evidence. And then they come and say like, I'm offering TMS already for 10 years in ADHD and I have amazing results. Why is it not on the list or, or other applications? And then it's a very clear case of a mismatch of your positive experience in your private practice, you know, where you have no doubt that it works but we don't have access to that data from a scientific point of view because you don't publish this. Or you don't have a control group. Why should you have a control group you're offering to your patients? It works. You don't want to randomize and offer 100 of your children a placebo stimulation. That's not how you operate. But then you don't provide the data that is needed to make it to that list. So there is a clear mismatch. And it could very well be that with time, more clinics, more researchers are also dedicating spending um, effort and money into running clinical trials in the context of ADHD and autism, they will end up at one point on this list. But this is at the moment the reason why they are not. But again, it doesn't mean that there are not, no published studies about this. Uh, there are a few, 10 to 15 studies, which scientifically speaking is nothing, unfortunately. Again, this is this mismatch between how science operates and how private practitioners operate. If you have one study and you have a great result, you think, I've shown it. You know? But scientists would say, like, yeah, you've shown it, but for me to believe it, I want to see three other people, independent from you, replicating it. Before this, I don't even think about it. So please realize this, um, this delay that the scientific evidence always have behind private pra practitioners. But here's a concrete study on autism, for example. It's an open-label study, so again, it's not properly controlled, scientifically speaking. But uh, they do a TDCS in the context of autism spectrum disorder. You do see that they report quantifi quantified uh, in a published scientific uh, study, they report positive effects of TDCS in the context of autism spectrum disorder. 
and the same for ADHD. So they looked very specifically at various you know, aspects, uh, hyperactivity, inattention, so the cognitive aspects, uh, impulsivity, and they see a significant improvement in this study in those children with ADHD using TDCS. So in this study it worked, not on the list yet because not, not enough studies, not enough children tested scientifically. And with this, I would already in, uh, hint to a talk that also comes later in the program. But for me personally, the greatest advantage of TDCS over TMS is, is the potential possibility to do TDCS um, in a home environment. So TMS is expensive. It has you know, certain, certain side effects that an, a, a specialist needs to deal with uh, when operating. So you need to go to a specialized clinic for TMS treatment. No doubt about that. It has to be operated by a specialist. TDCS is so, uh, has such a positive side effect and risk profile that this could be done at, ho at, at, at a patient's home using home use TDCS devices. And this is the, a great boom now in the TDCS um, research uh, and, and, and technological development uh, line. There are now devices available, and Plato Science is one example of those, not the only example, but it's one example that we are cooperating with as Maastricht University that have spent many years in designing a product that is so user-friendly and with such a safety profile that avoids misuse or overuse, that is cloud-based and remotely controlled, that people can actually use very comfortable in the, in the comfort of their own home. And we also have data now showing that home use TDCS is feasible, tolerable, and clinically effective in the context of depression, but also in other contexts. But you will hear more about this this afternoon on, um, on uh, the talk of home use TDCS. But for me, this is a very, very interesting addition to, uh, to the in-clinic uh, neurostimulation approaches. And with this, I would like to end, just point to what I already said, that we also now for 15 years, uh, we offer uh, certified trainings, three-day training programs uh, to teach everything there is to uh, know about TMS, but also TDCS, and also have hands-on uh, trainings uh, where many psychologists and psychiatrists follow our training to really get up-to-date on the most, um, most up-to-date clinically effective protocols and how to actually do it practically. And we offer those courses in, in, in various locations now, Amsterdam, London, Maastricht. Next month actually will be in Dubai because the demand, and this is also maybe good for you to, to know, the demand and the acceptance of this technology is actually um, increasing exponentially. So it's exploding. I just finished a London TMS course uh, yesterday, literally, and we had, again, an all-time high record of participants. So it is spreading the word, and, and I think... Um, in the next couple of years, we will see really game-changing um, uh, disruptive developments in that field. Uh, and I think it's time because we know it, it works already for, for a long time. And with this, I would like to end my presentation and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions or whether this is the idea at all. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yes. So, from research, you find TBCS more successful than TMS? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I don't think it's more successful than uh, TMS. Uh, but it has certain features that TMS uh, can't deliver, and this is, um, you know, the, the even more tolerable side effect profile, you know. For example, TMS has this potential side effect of inducing a seizure. It's very, very rare, but it ca could happen. It did happen in a few cases. That's impossible with TDCS, right? So, um, and, and other things, the discomfort. For certain groups, TDCS might be the, the better choice. Children, for example, I think would be a good starting point with TDCS. If that works, why, why go through to TMS uh, or, or pregnancy or things like, like that? And of course, this this, this possibility to do it in such a simple home use administered way, like, if, like in the case of the Play-Doh headset, if you have a headset uh, and you can do it in the home environment, think about, we talked about this also during the course, 
think about the problem, what do you do after the acute treatment? You have this five, six weeks of an acute treatment. For example, you go to a TMS clinic and you get a combination therapy and it's all great and it works wonderfully. You are in remission, but you cannot go to the clinic for the rest of your life. So you, at one point you need to go home or you're home and the therapy is finished. And, and we know from data, we know that for sure, if then you discontinue everything, you don't do anything anymore, the likelihood of relapse in the case of depression is very high, extremely high, like 80% within the first one year or so will relapse. So we're looking for something what we call maintenance therapy. And there it could be a perfect, you know, home use TDCS for maintenance is something that only TDCS can do because you cannot do home use TMS for maintenance, it's just not safe or also not, not very cost effective if every patient has their own TMS machine. Uh, but TDCS is so affordable uh, that you could scale it that people actually have something also at home to maintain their mental health at least for longer. And this is actually also research that we are looking at at the moment. You know, how much do you delay a relapse when you do home use TDCS following a successful TMS treatment, for example? Or psychotherapy or whatever kind of treatment. Yeah. Uh, just one more. Is it accessible for Thomas at the moment in rate to two appliances? Do you find that TMS is overleaving and it's more accessible to have TDCS? Yeah. That's so more convenient. Yeah. Um, but do you find the motion rate better at one better than the other? No. Yeah, I wouldn't I would say uh, it's no, I wouldn't say that, no. I mean also of course TMS just has more data still. I tried to say that in the beginning, so it's very interesting to see the parallels now, but it's it's a couple of years ahead also in terms of regulation and and with the regulation, with the FDA approval in 2008, there was also an explosion. Everybody realized, oh, there's, there's FDA approval. And then the entire world focused on one protocol for a while. And there was an amazing amount of data produced worldwide. Uh, so we have, we have a very solid uh, database there. And TDCS is lacking a bit behind when it comes to just a mere amount of data. But everything we know is that there's no reason to believe now that um, response or remission rate would be weaker or so for, for TDCS uh, compared to TMS. Uh, but I think in the, in the long run, I wouldn't say it's either the one or the other. I, I, I see a lot of merit in the, in the combination and they can be combined in, like I just set, set the most straight, straightforward combination. You could use it for maintenance, you know, the TMS in the clinic maintenance TCS outside or for, for particular populations. But we also know now, and I have no time to go into that, that the TMS um, treatment itself can also be made more effective by using TDCS to prime the brain. You know, there's, there's clear data on that, that you have a certain TDCS protocol preceding your TMS protocol, which makes the TMS protocol more um, consistent and, and robust and stronger. This has been shown in research. That could be a perfect combination as well. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, one or the other but looking at the data now of course it also depends on the private practice if you want to make a start tdcs of course is a is a from a cost effective point of view a, a, a different a different ball game in terms of the cost of the device is it's a factor 100 or so so that 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 is also something to consider They do this exercise to relax the vocal cords. Then open our uh, legs like this. Yeah, good. We're gonna get a breath from our noise, and then it's gonna go a bit like, like this. And then we're gonna give. Okay. Then we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this. Okay. Good. I can't hear anything. Uh, but with the help of Professor Sachs and his team, 
and uh, the Blatterberg team as well, and our Turkey team. Uh, we're going to try to give a kind of overview of what we are trying to do uh, cross Muslim in, in London and um, what will be what will we do with our research research uh, like future research project let's say. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, give a kind of content. Let me stay here. Is that good? Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go do some introduction about the research which we are currently doing. I'm going to give some aims and objectives about our research, and then I'm going to give some literature. Then Dr. Ice is going to follow up from methodology analysis and discussion. Always, all the questions can go to Dr. Ivan. I'm going to escape. No question. Thank you. Okay. Um, what we are trying to do in the clinic phase, we be trying to use TDCS and TMS uh, on autism, ADHD, and learning uh, with children from uh, 5 plus to uh, 16 years old, children and young people in the UK, let's say. Um, um, I think Professor Sachs gives lots of background information about TDCS and TMS. I'm not going to mention on them. Um, but what I'm going to mention is basically uh, we are using TDCS and TMS both, uh, in some cases, um, individual, uh, to, to do our research um, and then to provide some uh, uh, clinical services to patients. Uh, our research basically aims to get the use of TDCS, TMS, um, and combination of behavioral therapy and speech therapy, try to provide services to the clients, and then get some data from them and publish that data to find out if TDCS and TMS work in on autism, ADHD, and learning difficulties. Uh, what are we gonna, we're going to talk about the study design a little bit. Um, in, in later, but uh, basically our research design is um, separate for three uh, arms, let's say. I'm going to mention arm by arm um, in a minute, then you're going to see what we are doing in autism, what we are doing in ADHD, and what we are doing in learning difficulties. And then um, we are using standard protocols and then individualized protocols, which we are inspired by the uh, QEG. Um, if I came to the literature, I'll, I'll just quickly go uh, for this presentation a uh, Google Scholar search, but we're going to add most uh, other famous databases over here. It's interesting to see these keywords and very low um, numbers, like if, if you put ADHD and TMS or RTMS on search engine on Google Scholar, you're going to find out around 4,000 paper, which is really low. Like, if you put ADHD there, probably it's going to be 20,000 or that's 100,000. But if you put ADHD with TMS or RTMS, it's very, very low. And we haven't done any search on Cochrane Library or other databases. But uh, for our main study, we're going, to do, we're going to do them and we're going to have a kind of uh, strategic literature searching on that. If you put ADHD with TDCS and around 5,000, which is TDCS, if it's like 1,000 more than RTMS with, uh, with a, in, 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 a, uh, in ADHD case. If you put ADHD with behavioral therapy and RTMS, it's going down to 2000, which I'm going to show you on a chart with a visual. On learning difficulties, you can, as you can see, it's a bit higher. You can see that learning difficulties with RTMS is higher, TDCS is higher. It seems that on learning difficulty, because it's a very big umbrella, we got lots of research on, on there with RTMS, TDCS, and combination therapy with TMS and RTMS. Uh, but if you come to the autism, you see uh, this is QEG guided RTMS, like EEG or QEG guided RTMS, uh, which is very low, like it's found then probably 2000. And uh, if you check QEG guided TDCS, it's a bit higher than normal, but in autism, it's really low. And as you can see, it's a bit higher in behavioral therapy with RTMS and TDCS. But if you compare this with the learning difficulties, it's very, very low. This is it's not surprising, as Professor Sachs mentions, 
there is not enough evidence showing us that uh, TMS or TBC has broken because there is not enough research on, on the literature. If we check ADHD, as you can see over here, it's still a bit low on RTMS, but if you check ADHD with TBCS, it's a little bit higher than RTMS, which means that it seems like TBCS using most on ADHD and autism in, um, in, in, in the field rather than RTMS, which is... But if we check autism with RTMS, I think most of the problem there on TBCS, RTMS is most American research, because it's widely used there in the private sector, and um, you can see a bit like higher than normal other research, which is really interesting. And we've got QG guided like RTMS. It's, this is normal RTMS research on learning difficulties, very high. If you come to the QG guide, it's very low. This is showing us that this classic medical culture on psychiatry, I think, based especially, <coughs> uh, like. Um, they are not checking the brain before they do anything. They just do a consultation and then write the medication or whatever. But this effort showed us that if you check the organ first and see what's going on over there and then prescribe whatever the organ needs. This is a basic virus of I think it's America is getting growing now. They do PET scan first and then do the other therapies. This is a really interesting to see literature is basically showing that no one checking the brain first to do something. They just do something and try to check if that's work or not. Like, give antipsychotic <coughs> and wait for six months or three months, see the result, but there was no other side effect. Which is TMS or RTMS and TMS. Uh, if you compare with that, it's much safer and less uh, side effect, let's say. Um, I'm going to just mention about the randomized control trial. Uh, RTS or randomized control trial is the best evidence in the research area, let's say. Like they do control groups and try to get some evidence. This is a very interesting RTS, but it's not, um, it's just published around 2022. Uh, uh, but this RTS is itself is very limited to show us uh, enough evidence, but there are quite good. Uh, uh, evidence on this RTM is showing that um, 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 uh, the non-medicine uh, system working in some protocol working on especially for the anxiety, down um, anxiety and stuff like that. I'll have to mention the details. Um, I've done a couple of literature searching on systematic review just because systematic review is covering like last 10 years, like 5 years, last 20 years research, which you can get a kind of summary overview of what's going on in that sense, in the literature. This is uh, Autism RTM and Systematic Review, published 2021. Uh, which one is, this is quite an interesting, I think, paper, which they, they find 60 studies. Uh, um, they've got some different um, uh, uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. But one here, uh, they use left dorsal prefrontal cortex protocols, which we are mainly using in TMS. And um, then you check the result, the outcomes. Uh, they've got some promising outcomes on behavioral change, but still, um, they're, they're, it's just not enough because it's just 16 studies, which they focus on that. And I've got another autism TDCS, which was published in 2022. This one is quite different, uh, it's a very interesting one because the uh, success rate is quite high in ADHD and mistakes as well which is um, some of our clients in our, our clinic got dyslexia uh, with autism or dyslexia and ADHD and it's quite good to see that uh, RTLS and TBCS work in that sense um, and I found some self uh, uh, study for ADHD in RTLS which is another interesting point uh, this is not really focused on like 18 studies in this 18 studies, you've got four RTMS, uh, four Gs, TDCS, and delivered on around 300 uh, 11 children. And um, results um, of their shows that um, there are some little improvement, but in this, I think I, there is some limitation on this research. What they done, they are not scoring what is in ADH children, which is, they just do, uh, they just use the TMS and TDCS. Get the result and try to compare that 
in quality text and pictures being set subjectively, but they need some objective measurement like QDG, first QDG, second QDG, first scoring, second scoring. This is a limitation of this, um, um, this, this, this graph A plus um, In here, ADHD and TDC is considered to go quite a few very good evidence showing that in, the, um, in this uh, specific study period, they group up around 383 uh, articles, which means a published paper, and um, they were nearly up to 45 of them, um, showing that um, they've got quite successful um, results on, on, on TDCS and ADHD. Um, for the very difficult TDCS, uh, uh, because learning difficulty, if you use learning difficulty as, a, as an umbrella term, it's quite hard to find um, um, test, uh, test, uh, uh, the test result. But if you, if you, if you look, learn in the level of learning difficulties like mental retardation or dyslexia or dyscalculia or whatever, then you can find quite a few papers on there. But there are some uh, good systematic reviews uh, in the on learning these parts and assignment. Most majority, majority of the research on learning difficulty area, which is really interesting. Uh, and Dr. Items uh, go from yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, I would like to start and talk about uh, um, our treatment first. As you know, um, the difference on our treatment, we have been doing it for the personalized and the QEEG guided. So, so far the evidence, the literature shows us that we have lots of trials and, and we've been hearing from uh, this clinic in, in, in this country, that clinic in other countries trying to do the TMS for autism and they keep failing and they are getting lots of uh, backslash from the families because the kids out of control, the kids become more aggressive, the, the kids become more hyperactive. So what is the difference that what we have been doing so far and we are getting good results and we are not getting that similar results to them? The first of all, I would like to give some important points on our study, on our research and as well as clinical try in our both London clinic and in Turkey. At the moment, the, the biggest problem is we are facing with the families this. Now we've been doing this uh, research, both TMS and TDCS, and everybody is asking about, in a way, the, of a question about, you know, which one is better? Uh, if we come to UK, is it going to be better treatment? Or if you're going to be in, in, in using the TDCS at our home, are we going to have the same effects with the treatment? Well, obviously, this is not a straightforward answer. But at the moment, what we have we have lots of literature and lots of information behind the TMS, like Professor Sack explained us, and, and, and less information about TDCS, but that doesn't mean one or other is better than the other. Now, the, the problem is, um, well, in a way that if I can explain you uh, less scientifically for the families to understand, uh, they work different ways, but they do the same thing at the end. So, in a way that TMS activating the neurons, sending the, uh, which neurons you want to activate, and at the same time, if you need to relax the functions, it has available in the TMS as well. So you relax that part and activate the non-working part, and it just, just directly do it through the neurons. And in TDCS, if you look at it in an easy way to understand, it works through the waves. So TDCS does the same thing, does the activate and does the relax the parts, but it does it on the waves. So once the wave starts to activate and works, it goes back and kicks the neurons and, and combine them to get activation. So in a way that probably after a few years later, we're going to do a new research combination with TMS and TDCS connected together. Uh, so this will be probably getting more and better results. So, at the moment, now, what, what else we have for the, uh, there is one more thing on why uh, our research and our, at the moment, clinical trials is important. Because so far, everybody is doing this uh, research through the TMS without any guidance. Yes, 
We have the standards. We have the gold standards in TMS, FDA approved. Uh, so we have the depression, okay? Everybody knows about what we did on the depression and how we get the good result. So our problem is here, once, once we do this with kids and once we do personalize them, let's say, uh, let's, let's do a depression treatment for a kid without the QEG. And if we do the QEG and if we see, let's say from the left, left frontal cortex, if they have a, an epileptic waves, what's gonna happen? You try to treat their depression, but then you trigger their epilepsy. So that is why personalized treatment is so important. And it is so important to see which waves has the epileptic waves, epileptic issues in the brain, which functions and where. So I think this is the most important part on our treatment that we first analyze the brain, scan the brain, and see all the problems. So this is why where we target and personalize the TMS protocols as well. So it's not just standard TMS, do left, da, 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 tick, tick, and wait the results. We check everything, okay, we have to use low frequency because there's an epileptic wave. So we have to treat that part first. So once you treat, it starts to work. And then you have not active functions, they are in alpha, they are sleeping. So you have to activate them. So we start to activate. But during your activation, because we are working one-to-one -one with kids, you have to always watch them, you have to always see them, you have to always see their reaction, you have to see the family's reaction. The next day after you've done the treatment, the next day family comes and say, oh, we can't sleep all night. He was awake, she was awake, walking, shouting. So you can't do activation again, it's no point, so you have to relax them. So you have to do these things, obviously one-to-one, -one. you have to see the patient, yeah, we have the map, and the map says you have to activate both frontal lobes, but you can't if the activation makes them more aggressive, if the activation makes them more activate. So you have to act looking at the children, looking at how they go, and, and that is, again, uh, I think our success comes through this, because seeing the kids, applying the protocols, but at the same time personalize them, and try to be careful not to trigger. So far, I have been doing this over four years. So, um, started to work with Oxford and the Mastery. It has been over more than a year now. Uh, but before, I've been doing this. So, the most important problem is, is not to trigger, not to make any harm, trying to make things better. You can't make things worse. So, this is the most important thing. Okay. So, um, obviously this is a comparative research. Uh, we compare the different quantitative data in different conditions and, and randomly selected control groups. So, uh, obviously the participants will randomly select it by their diagnosis. Um, so, we have the, on the data collection, we have these six steps. So, the initial assessment, We'll do press scoring assessment, autism, ADHD, and learning difficulties. And we have the pre qeg And then on the step four, we have the TMS, RTMS, TDCS sessions, and plus behavioral therapy. And step five, post-score assessment and post-QEG. So um, on the assessment tools, obviously we have been using uh, some standards, ACRS uh, tools. Uh, and we also have been using the same assessment tools for ADHD from rating scale uh, 5 uh, for children and adolescents. They have all uh, age differences. And also we have been using the learning difficulties assessment tools to assess the learning difficulties rating scale. Um, on the ACRS, is it has 6 to 18 years and, and, and it has uh, less than 5 years as well. So we have been doing these uh, autism spectrum rating scales as well. Um, on the ADHD rating, we have been using the uh, checklist norms and clinical interpretation on these reports as well for to getting the rating scale. And for the parent driving, learning disabilities, evaluation scales and Interventionally, we have been using these as well. 
So, as you know, we've been talking about QG a lot, um, and it has been a, a very good journey working with the QEG. And so far, we've been using Mitsar QEG devices, and we've been using a lovely reports from Olga. <laughs> um, but this is not the caps that we've been using because we thought it's gonna uh, scare the kids that all these connections. So thanks to one of the Chinese companies produce us a special uh, caps, just only one connection going into the 2014. There is no try to connection. It's just we put the gels before, put the cap on and it's there. And on the uh, TNS, we have been using two different machines. I think this makes a lot of difference because overall the world, we know lots of countries and lots of uh, manufacturers available. So far, we have been using two good manufacturers, two good machines, Maxim and MagVentures, and they both, we are combining them during the treatment. So it's not only one machine we use, we use two machines on the, within the 30 session and allow them to have that both machines differences, but they are almost similar machines. They are getting probably the best results within regarding the, if we search the TMS machines around the world, these are the two, the most acceptable, like NHS, like in the US, there are most of uh, hospitals, uh, governments accept these machines and using these machines. And we have also plot of science. Uh, after me, they are going to talk about it. So these devices um, we started to use in Turkey and we are going to use in UK as well. Um, well, they are medical devices, class one devices, um, but at the same time, they have a very easy use and at home. So the, the good point is using them at home because we know these children, it's difficult to travel. It is very difficult to take them in a, in a new places. So when you use them at home, you have the benefits of using it in their environment. And at the background, while you are using it, how many minutes you are using, what you are doing, which protocols you are using, we are monitoring these details at the back. So it means you are under control. And before you use these, we'll do the QEG. We'll check everything and we'll give you the recommendation of the treatment. So based on our recommendation, you use the simple app, choose the options that we give you, 30 minutes per session done. So the TDCS is, is, is very handy and it's growing at the moment. So um, as well as the UK and as well as Turkey, we are going to use more and more. Okay, for the QEG reports from the uh, brain fitness, at the moment we have been using these since we started the study. So far, um, I think we have over 800 uh, QEG scans. So some of them is already second, not the pre-done and then post-done. And because of the, I think this after holiday in, in October, we will have probably upcoming another hundred. And so every month is growing and growing because it takes around six months to get pre and post results. So it is taking time. It's a study. Uh, the results are good. We are always talking to families and we are always in the connection. But it's just taking time to get the results inside. So um, on the team, on the QEG reports, we have been showing lots of lots of results. We have been giving lots of information to families. Normally, any families who has been so far diagnosed, even if they do MRI or any other scans or any any genetic uh, searches through there, is it is it coming from any? any genetic problems, issues, this, that. They don't actually give any, any report information, even the MRI if, or, or from the EEG. They say, okay, don't, don't, you don't have any epilepsy. Uh, thickness of the scalp is fine. That's it. That's the whole information you can get from the doctors. But on QEG, we have like 20 to 25 pages. And each time these pages explained for the families that um, how your children and how they, his functions are. Um, in our study, normally, like as Ali explained, you go to a doctor, you tell what is the problem about your children, you explain what their reactions, what their behaviors are, what they can do, what they don't do. 
in ours, we don't want to see the kids even from the beginning. All we want to scan the brain, get the results, and then we explain what they can do, what they can't do, where their functions are working, whether they are not working. And this is the, I think, beauty, listening from someone within like 15, 20 minutes, the history of your children. And most of the time I get a response saying the families that I can't even describe my children in 10, 15 minutes the way you describe it to me. So this is, this is really good because this gives us an understanding that what we can do, what we've been doing is correct. What we've been capturing on the QEG is 100% spot on, all these informations. So this study, you have the three different research lines as we talk about it. It is from the autism, ASD, it is ADHD, and it is the learning difficulties. So, children diagnosed with ASD, we have it currently personalized and the standard, two different groups, uh, plus they all behavioral therapy as well. The, the, this is for the children diagnosed with autism. We will be the comparing the effects of the behavioral therapy We'll have the sham and TMS and combined behavioral therapy plus RTMS. And uh, for all those, and we have also compared effects of standard QEG guidance, RTMS protocol on the treatment of the children. And we also compare effects of behavioral therapy plus sham and TDCS uh, and combined behavioral therapy plus TDCS. And we also compare the effects of standard QEG guidance PDCS protocols on the treatment of the children with ASD. And on the second line of the research, we've been doing the same things for the ADHD for children. We're going to again affect the compare, uh, compare the effects of behavioral therapy plus sham, RTMS, and combined behavioral therapy plus RTMS. Do the same things for uh, two, second, third, and the fourth. So both. Uh, QED guided uh, protocols and we'll do the same everything to ADHD. So they are all 20, 20, 20, 20, but obviously it's adding and adding. It looks 20 when you first look, it's small, but when it comes to yeah, end, it will get more. So we'll do the same on the children diagnosed with learning difficulties. This is again same compare effects to behavioral therapy, sham RTMS, uh, compare effects to standard and QED guided. Uh, compare effects to behavioral therapy plus sham TDCS and compare effects to standard and QEG guided TDCS protocols. So, uh, currently the sample consists of uh, 240 children. So, at the moment, our targets to get them around up to 2000. So, that we need to have large enough because so far what we can see the literature, there is not enough data. So that is what we are trying to do, to collect more data to prove that these treatments can also effective for ASD, ADHD, and learning difficulties, which is not an easy job. Um, the participants will be recruited in three groups. So 80 diagnosed with ASD, 80 diagnosed with ADHD, and 80 diagnosed with learning difficulties. Uh, participants will be randomly selected at the researcher clinics. We have the both Turkey and the UK. So the pilot study at the moment we had, uh, we had the 20 participants' results, pre and post results. Well, obviously it's because of the holidays and everything. Some of the families delay their post QEGs. And even if they did some of them, it takes time to get them into the system. So at the moment we have 20 participants, but so far, We've done 800 QEGs, the first, and we have done almost, uh, the post is almost waiting over 200. So the soon, around the maybe New Year time, we will have at least these, going to be 10 times more. So, so on the chart, um, we have the pre and post QEGs. So as you can see, the EEG1 and EEG2, in, in some of the chart here as you can some of the functions we have a, a good differences some of the functions we have stabilities these doesn't mean actually when you look at the chart and when you look at the, all our assessments and behavior of the kids 
this score probably double. Because when you look at the neurological differences in QEG, even three months after the TMS is not actually give you the enough information on their differences on their brain. And sometimes when you see their attentions, even if you first normal or norm on the attention is two, and then when you do the first scan, their attention, let's say eight, which is bad, very bad. But then after the second QEG, this attention could be 10. So that doesn't mean they have lost their attention they got first. No, they have lots of different activities and they have lots of different changes in behavioral understanding and awareness. But so when you even scan them on the QEG, you still won't get the 100%. That's why we are using all these assessment tools so that we combine the information and, and actually project the reality of the children's and, and their family's life. So on the pre and post score, again, the plot area shows the difference on the pre and, and post. You still have good results, differences. You can see quickly in, in most of the functions. But as I say, it's again, we just need to combine the pre and post and as well as the assessments together to show the reality. So on the pre and post score scales, data will be analyzed by the research team. And the pre and post QG data will be analyzed by the team and they will generate individualized detailed reports. So, primary line pilot results. Okay. Now, we have a group of patients and I would like to give three of them as, a, as just an information to understand uh, how their life changed, how their uh, behavioral change and, and also their brain. So we have the, go back, sorry. Okay, so we have the patient one here. Oh, okay, so we have the improvement identified in a form of below list. So if we look at the left, first one, you see, this is the first QEG. So if you look at the brain of the first one, or oh, why is it keep moving, go back. Okay, so if we look at the first, so we can see this kid is not talking. His both motor functions, uh, verbal expression is not working, memory, working memory, emotional functions, attention. So all these functions is not working. So uh, from the first QEG, we can also see some issues on the emotional understanding and as well as the uh, temporal lobe. So after 30 session of TMS, now this is how this patient won. So as you can see, most of his verbal function is back um, and they are working. The anxiety, depression side, uh, attention, uh, emotional expression, motor functions, memory, they're all working. So they have, now it has learning issues, verbal learning, and, um, sorry, it keeps going on. Verbal learning, there's no pause, isn't it, on this? Uh, and the mathematical learning on here, it needs to be proved. So, when we start index of inattention 10 on the first QEG, on the second QEG, the index of inattention score comes to three. So, this is within the first three months after the 30 session. So. If I talk about this as a patient, is around 14 years old when the mother comes to the clinic. He explained about his son that he can't understand about danger, he can't understand aware of anything. Obviously no communication and, and very aggressive and, and very strong kid, big kid. So he has been even when he's get angry, hit his mom or dad without understanding that whether what he has been doing. So after the 30 session, uh, and when they even can't go to shopping, when they go to shopping, he doesn't know whether if something needs to be buy it first, pay it first, and then go outside and eat it, let's say. He go and find anything if he wants to grab it and try to open it there. So, it's very hard to go to social environment, take him to the shopping malls, take him to the anywhere in the shopping. And after that 30 session, what we had as a result, 
he is now understanding and waiting in the queues. He is now understanding and um, the only difference on the talking part that we saw here, that his F7 and F3 is actually activated, but the family talks Turkish. And, and obviously the school, everybody talks in English. So the school says he has words and he starts to talk with the teachers, but the family, they can't understand whether he's not speaking in Turkish. So, well, we have another issue is, you know, these kids, when you have the two languages, bilingual, there is always issue there. So it seems like he likes English more and, and he prefers to speak English, but because family cannot speak English, he just prefer to keep shy and, and not to talk. But hopefully in future, we can hear that the family say he starts to Turkish and translate it as well. So he had a huge difference, a huge jump from the first 30 session. And if we go to patient two, Okay, let's see the improvements. Its index of inattention improved, first evaluation 12, and on the post 6, so almost doubled. The attention almost doubled. Decreased relative delta, theta power. So all these areas is a big, big difference in the activation level improved. So, have a look. This is the first QEG. FP1, FP2, most of the functions, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 12 function is not actually working well. And after the first QEG this the, and the second QEG, three months later after the treatment, you see the difference? Now he has only a frontal and, and now comparing to 12, he has now two for like six, seven. So this is a big difference. Their lives completely change. The kids completely change. It, it is really a big difference within the 30 session. So index of inattention between six to 12. So imagine you had the first in inattention 12, the score, the norm score is two. So if you are less than two, your attention is good, you are focusing very well, but if it goes to up three, four, five, six, the goes up, the more, the worse the concentration level, the worse the focusing level. So between 12, it goes up to six. So this is a huge impact. This is a huge difference. So improvement identified, non-pathological activities, decrease relative delta, increase relative alpha, Brain activation balance improved, no asymmetry in central parental and occipital areas identified. So, at the moment, this is the third one. So, we have the, as you can see, two, three, four, five, seven, nine functions out of 21 is not working. This is the second QEG uh, later, three months later, after the first RTMS student. Unfortunately, when we first start, the QEG machine is not there. So we couldn't able to take the first QEG. So the only QEG get is when we start the second. So his functions worse than that when we first start. And now after the 30 session, this also improves us. This also gives us another information because sometimes families ask, like, okay, we do the 30 session. Do you think we can have the same effects on the second 30 sessions or the third 30 sessions you know how many how many 30 sessions we need to do so this is also gives us a good result good, good information about the the more we focus on the certain areas the more activation or relaxation if we need we get so this is about because when you come to the tms obviously you have pointing the problems so if you have out of 21 functions, if you have 13, 14 functions is not working, obviously you can't do in 30 session. We need to focus two or three areas maximum and do 10 of each. So, and then you get this kind of result. Now you see. So his life completely changed. The way he talks, the way he understands, the way he describes things, he's, he's back, to, back to normal. So, Index of inattention, even on the second TMS, 
14. And now index of inattention increased to 5. So um, let me give you brief information from these patients when they first visit me. He's around 13 years old. He came with his dad. Um, we sat on the first floor, I remember like yesterday, and to he, his father talking about himself, you know, his children, the problems he's explaining. And he was sitting just in, across to me, but he's not there, he's not listening to us, he's, he's somewhere else, he's just thinking, doing, saying some stuff. He's verbal, he's, he can talk, but whatever he talks, you really don't understand. He, when you ask something, he can reply, but reply not what you ask. He, the reply something he keep repeats. It could be a movie that he remembers, it could be some of his relatives' words or some of their friends something. He repeats, he keep repeats, and you say, how are you? And then you say something else. So, so far, it is very hard to communicate. Um, but it's not aggressive, it's not much uh, big issues, but understanding, awareness, uh, talking, communication is, is totally out of function. So, after the third session, but well, the second one, I can't explain how the big difference is. So, he's, when you talk in the room, he's 100% control what you are talking about. He understands and he has his own opinion. He's not looking at his mom's or dad's eyes before he starts to talk. He has the self-confidence, very improved. He also, the understanding about the environment, about the surrounding, and even we had some opinion from his school, his, one of his teachers, to say, he used to hide around, around back of the area, so you can't even see. Now he comes and asks me how am I and what I've been doing. So now the communication skills, the self-awareness, the self-confidence is going up and high. So he can do now at the moment, uh, when they, as a family going out, he's going out before his mom and turn on the ignition, get the car ready for his, for, for, for his mom. So, he is making a lot of effort, but don't forget, this is not only the TMS treatment. There is a big, big important element here, the families. The families are so important. You can't just expect the treatment and then the kids come and talk and do lots of things. The family spends a lot of time. The family care, take care of him too much. The family look after him and always, uh, always pushing him for more and more. So the families are so important. They have to be together, they have to look after them. This is like a new start. Forget about this, for that before the 13 years, before he came, forget about the past, because he can't learn, he can't remember things that he learned. But after the treatment, now he can learn. He can keep it in his mind, and he can give back a feedback to you. So it's a new start, you can't just Focus about the past and your old experience. Now you have to start like he's, he's a baby. So all you need to give him more and more and ask him, push him more and more, do things, do more exercise, do more work. And you, this, is, this is where you get these results. This is not only TMS, this is TMS plus the family. That is the big difference. Okay, so we have some scenes from our uh, clinic. We have lots of nice and happy patients, nice families. We have lots of improvements. So far, uh, we have at least six, seven kids. They, their family, their school thinks that they are out of autism. They could be in the normal classes rather than a special school. So the changes are coming slowly. The changes are coming very strongly. So. Each time we do the personalized QEG guided RTMS and TDCS treatment, we just, need, we just don't need to forget that the families has to support the kids, the educational system has to support these kids. Before the education, without activating the function, is too difficult. You are like trying to give him something, but the learning functions are not responding. So it's very hard to get any out of it. But after the TMS or TDCS, once these functions are start running, 
then you will have the chance to teach them, you will have the chance to give them something and get it back. So this is where it starts, it's not finished, this is where it starts. And I want all these families to uh, understand their children's situation and understand the functions, understand what they are doing. Before you try to teach them, they are not going to get anything out of it, but after the treatment, things will change. So you have to start over. You have to be patient. So, okay. Um, I would like to thank you all listening and coming here. Um, it was really a pleasure to, to do this seminar and it's really a proud of uh, for our company, Cosmos Healthcare, uh, collaborating with Oxford University and Maastricht University and, and our research and clinical trial and, and more scientific results will be published as soon as we have more data. And once we have reached a certain level, I believe we will be in the literature showing that these uh, stimulations, non-invasive treatment will be effective for ASD, ADHD and learning difficulties. Thank you very much. See, I explained very well. <laughs> That's fine. There is no question. <laughs> or everyone slept. Or everyone slept, yeah. Yes. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I don't know how many of you experienced the TMS here, but obviously it has a small effect the stimulation, the magnetic stimulation, the more obviously the power you have, the more you feel. But we usually keep that low in the children, but they still feel the tick, tick, tick. They still feel them. And at some stage, I have a seven years old uh, girl. She was, once it's finished, I show her that kissing the machine. I said, what? what's happening? And it's just in a way that I understand that that machine, that device can help her and she understand it. So she was, the, the one question she asked for mom after the treatment, her mom was calling us, she was crying and say, she was asking me because she heard something in the class and she come back her mom and say, mom, other kids learn lots of things over the last years. Where were I? Where was I? It's just, I don't understand. I was there. I went there last year, they learned lots of things, and now I don't know them, what happened? So it's, it's so really emotional when they contact you and call you. We, in, in the clinic, uh, most of my team is here, we always have lots of emotional moments with the families because of the changes. But maybe you can see a small step that kids saying that he, has, he wants to go to the toilet and, and he show it to you. So it is actually a big difference. It is actually, a, for family's life, a big difference. So these emotional things always happening in our clinic and, and it is really very good to have them sharing with us. Um, I also have a private Facebook group. So far, I think over 2,400 families in there. Uh, so probably maybe half of them has already been to us, treated by us, so they are giving evidence, they are giving videos, they are sharing how their children and how their life changed. So this is, I think this group is going to grow because before last year it was 300, now in a year it is 2,400 families and more and more families every day between 50 to 15, 15 to 50 families try to access this group and want to join and see how the treatment works, ask questions, because this treatment has to be transparent. The, the families understand if there is any consequence, if there is any side effect, if there is any problems. So families have to tell each other that, ah, I had these issues, but now it's happening this. So because of the TMS activation protocols, we have been lots of activation issues. Once you activate the functions, Sometimes they become too agitated, they become too aggressive. So for us, we usually tell them, okay, take him, take her to the swimming. 
get them more sports because the more activation, especially during the corona pandemic, unfortunately the kids at home, these kind of problems worsen. We had lots of issues, they had lots of issues, but now things get better, so they will access all the swimming pools, they will access all the parks. So the more obviously get activation, it takes around three to four and the functions come. So you have a period of, uh, because of temporarily side effect, which means more activated, but they're already active. All they become is more activated, but it's only take three to four weeks, and it is only happening maybe half of it. So not all of them, not everybody has to have the same effect and same problems. Uh, some of them become happy, keep laughing, and, 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 or no reaction, just normal. So this, at the end, it takes only two, three weeks or maximum a month. And after that month, they call and say, ah, she starts to talk. Ah, he starts to do this. So all these functions that we work on starts to come. So it's just a matter of time. Yes. Um, well, we are not actually, because most of them, some of them, they've been using ADHD medication or ASD medication. Currently, the TMS can work with the medication, so we don't actually, this is, this is the different part, they deal with their uh, neurologist or psychiatrist or their GP. The last question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Do you see them? Do you take them off? Or do you put them in the lake? It doesn't matter. Um, on the TMS, we want them to be awake. Uh, because obviously we are dealing with the frequencies. We don't want them to be in sleeping mode in alphas and everything. So we prefer them to be awake. So most of the time, Either we give them tablets during the sessions or, or phones to, to just uh, concentrate about something or give them something that they can actually uh, play with. So it's better for them to awake, and that's what we prefer. Thank yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here, and I'm really happy that we work together without the king and Ali and all the team and it's really lovely to finally met because actually uh, when we start all this process it was the pandem pandemic time and all our communication happened actually through the internet and that is really funny that when we met now it's like we have been working together for years at least i have this kind of feeling and um, so thank you so much for this and i will uh, try to explain um, the idea of, e of QEG and why we are doing this and uh, why it's so important to have this differential diagnostic, uh, what it's give us and what it's give to the professional uh, people who work uh, not only with um, uh, medication but also in psychology, how they can use this QEG approach. And um, of course, uh, today we talk quite a lot about neurodevelopmental disabilities. And um, I, also, I, I didn't tell you before, but I also have my uh, small practice. Um, so uh, I'm working with different kind of disease and uh, many people um, coming with uh, different type of anxiety disorder, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I have uh, cases with TBI, post-stroke, and of course also the children with neurodevelopmental disabilities. So I can see from the different angles, I also have education as a psychologist and um, psychotherapy provider. So uh, that's why I'm going to talk about um, reality. When you are, let's say, in the field, it's not just from the research point of view from the university, but when you really just come, you sit in your office and then you're faced with reality. So let's start with um, uh, what is this uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. And uh, as you know, uh, children can suffer from different kind of stuff. And uh, anxiety disorder actually is 15%, uh, 
depression, learning disability, ADHD, autism and Asperger's is about 1% just only, if it will be pure uh, diagnosis, right? Um, it's not surprising also that many kids, they suffer with stroke, which is often goes under diagnosed, but then we have a problem in the future. So when we talk about neurodevelopmental disorder, we don't know at which stage it's happened, what happened during the development. Um, also, everybody told us that uh, if once someone gets a neurodevelopmental disability, it means it's a lifelong problem. And people who was diagnosed with ADHD in ch childhood, they usually have it to the rest of their life, at least it was until now until we introduce the RTMS center. Yeah, but uh, of course there are some medication. Of course it's possible to apply different kind of um, psychotherapy approach and uh, there's special education for the kids, but still the problem exists and still needs uh, an attention. Um, so where our QEG can be handy, because if we talk about let's say ADHD. Besides that there are many types of different types of ADHD, there is inattentive type, uh, there is, um, uh, oops, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, if we have like a person with ADHD, so he can have uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it can be attention disorder, it can be combined time, then he, he can have a lot of emotional issues, uh, he can have overfocus also. And besides this, uh, I hope slides is coming soon, uh, we always have comorbidity. It means that there is not just one problem, it's usually coexist with something else, like the person can be diagnosed with ADHD, but at the same time he has some epileptic discharges in his brain, or maybe even was diagnosed with epilepsy. He can have also um, learning disability, he can be anxious or have even like general anxiety disorder at the same time so we don't know where to what to treat first let's see another problem is uh sometimes the diagnostic work like this if we just only talk about questionnaires what usually health providers use in diagnostic screening um, the person who is heavily anxious he is not going to concentrate this is reality. So his concentration is going to be poor. So should we give him diagnostic as person with ADHD or he is simply in a general anxiety disorder and we should treat this one. So uh, what I was going to say, so we have subtypes of uh, different um, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, we have complications inside and we have to be aware of this. But how do we know if we only talk about questionnaires? on this general screening. Not everybody have access to fMRI or PET scans will be also very handy in the future. But if we talk about, let's say, 2,000 patients who is waiting list, uh, how we are going to provide to everyone that's fMRI. So that's why, for example, uh, QEG is much more cheaper device. It can be added to basically any clinic. It doesn't take so, so much space, doesn't need um, that kind of heavy prerequisites for this. So it can be really useful. Yeah, thank you so much. So this is the slide I was going to show you. Um, so we have, um, ah, okay, it was, yeah, we have like uh, in ADHD child, you can have speech problem, very well, depression, yes, anxiety, conduct disorder, learning disability, a lot. Of course, they, it's complicated to learn if you can concentrate on something. At the same time, um, there is some uh, problem with uh, anxiety disorder, as I say. Uh, they can have different kind of mood disorder, uh, of course, uh, drug dependencies, and so on. Uh, autism, same thing. So a little bit different problem, of course, because in this case, uh, quite often uh, we have problems with mental retardation. Epilepsy happens a lot in this group of children. Anoresis, ADHD. So what is coming first? ADHD or, or Asperger or 
autism, what it is. Social phobia, yes, true, and so on. So all kinds of problems can coexist together in the same person. And especially epilepsy, like I mentioned, is one of the biggest problems in this um, group. And uh, it doesn't need to be uh, real seizures, but their EEG pattern show abnormalities. And it means that we never know what can happen. It can be so that at one day they develop some more serious condition. And it's also an indication for us as a health providers what we can do and what we cannot do. As already Dr. Altekin told us that um, there, sometimes we need to be aware of what type of uh, protocol we use with Artemis. And if there is any even slight um, possibility to develop seizures, we should be aware of this. But how do we know if we only see the patient look at him from outside, say, oh, okay, let's do this or that. Yeah, and now why it's all happened, it's also sometimes um, uh, my clients asking me a lot, especially parents, but why, why we are doing everything, we were so good family, why it's happened, why we have to suffer from this. Uh, actually, this all happened probably before your child even born and uh, it happened in different stage of the development because development of the brain is very, very, very complex process. It's uh, at any stage, something can be happen. So we have um, like a time, so-called neurogenesis. It's before the child born, right? So in this time, uh, for example, maybe there's not enough neural cells was developed or they don't differentiate in the right way because actually in the brain, there's many different types of neurons. Um, and um, maybe they don't grow in the right direction because there was some major problem with uh, specific factors, growing factors. Uh, maybe it's not, it wasn't enough glial cells. It's another cells in the brain that support neurons, that feed neurons and uh, help them to communicate between each other. We don't know when it's happened. Then uh, there is also after birth, many things can happen. Like for example, uh, children's um, neurons, they may not, uh, develop well enough, uh, or uh, maybe they have too much neurons that stay. They don't develop in the normal neurons, but they still stay there and they don't let the network to become more organized. This is the problem. And this uh, problem for, uh, especially for autism, they have actually extra cells because glial uh, system, uh, glial cells, they don't take care about this for some reason. And it's often a genetic problem, but why it's a different story. So for parents, it's very, very important to understand that it's not anybody's fault. It's just happened. It's happened because so at some stage, some DNA didn't produce the right um, work, what they should do. And uh, this is actually one picture from one of my research on the stem cells. This is real uh, neurons, human neurons. We grow them on this um, maya plate, so-called. And then we look what happened during the development. So normally, in uh, just at the beginning, there is a bunch of cells and they are very small. You can basically see anything. But already in 14 days, they start to create really nice bodies, and they also grow these beautiful connections. So that's how it's all happened. But you should notice that it's a lot of cells here, and many of them die in the process, and this is a good thing. There shouldn't be too many, or they are going to interfere and don't let the network to organize. Uh, yeah, also important thing is um, sensitive periods in the language development. Uh, we also uh, should notice that at some stages, uh, kids, they learn better and uh, they can develop uh, really nicely and uh, um, they can learn a lot of things, much more than adults. It's all because of sensitive periods. What it means, it means that uh, the neuroplasticity at this period of time 
is really um, it's really big and uh, cells, they really um, doing work very nicely. They create new synapses, they create new connection, uh, different, even distant part of the brain, they connect with each other. Uh, they try to organize a beautiful network and so on. But in many cases, if you talk about children with neurodevelopmental disabilities, uh, they, they struggle to, to develop in the right way. Yeah, um, besides the cortical structures, we also have subcortical areas, right? And the brain is very complex, hierarchical system. We don't, don't go there deeply. Just I want to say that at some period of time, uh, our more old brain structures, they develop. And usually they develop first. And uh, then we have some limbic system, which is taking care about our emotion. Then just after uh, some time, we have development um, in the hemispheres. Of course, this happens all the time, but like the peak of this development happened um, at certain age. Why I'm showing this? Because when we talk about kids with different kinds of developmental disabilities, they are behind in their development. And if, for example, normal child in um, age 10 have very well developed frontal cortex, child with ADHD is going to be behind at least for three years, maybe more, it depends. And also uh, uh, the development process is going a specific direction. And this is important information for QEG specialists and for specialists who are reading then QEG to understand what's going on. Should it be normal that at this moment of time, at this age, this child has underdeveloped area at certain part of the brain, or maybe it's not normal. This we all should be aware of. Yeah, and uh, the brain, it's not working just like, let's say, some cortical area. It's always cortical, subcortical areas. Then we have distributor, distributed brain networks, uh, distributed maps uh, on the cortex. So it usually allows us to, for example, if something happened, so another part of the brain can take this function uh, and try to repair things, let's say. Yes, and also uh, our cortical areas, as I mentioned, they uh, start develop at certain uh, with certain pattern, if I can say that. Uh, so first, we have some sensory cortexes that develop, and we can see it from the QEG also. Already in age five, we know how it should looks like and. Um, what's the normal uh, situation and uh, what's the dishes, what if it's not normal, so what we can see. Um, and if we don't see enough mature uh, cortical areas or let's say uh, EEG, which is reflecting this, uh, the level of maturation also, so then we can say that something wrong here, that probably we need to stimulate or we need to give more uh, energy to this part that it's start developing better. Uh, so in normal time, um, we can say that usually very low frequency activity we see uh, around age from zero to four. It's a normal case. But as uh, you remember from the previous presentations, children in with uh, autism in 13, 14 years, they can have delta activity as the main activity in the brain, which is very surprising because normally we see it uh, in the very deep sleep, for example, or in very young kids. Uh, delta activity also develop at certain age from eight to 12. And if we don't, uh, if, uh, for example, in um, age 12 and 14, the EEG is predominated in theta activity. It means it's heavily underactivated. There is not enough activation in the brain going on. Why? This is a different story, but at least here we can take some action and we try to
to activate. Uh, usually this kind of um, problem with activation level uh, leads to the symptoms and some behavioral manifestations, so you can see that something is not completely right. Yeah, th this is about um, distributed brain networks. Uh, why I'm showing you this is, again, important uh, for us to understand. Um, when we, You already uh, show, uh, saw some maps, uh, and then we mark some brain areas that, for example, in the frontal, it was uh, many places underactivated, what it means. Uh, actually, uh, our behavior are controlled by distributed brain networks, and we have different networks like uh, auditory networks, for example, visual network, uh, then uh, sensory motor network, and so on. Um, if we have problem with some of these areas, network, it means that there's few areas, they work together simultaneously they cooperate to produce this very complex behavior of ours and if something happened at one part of this network it means that all other parts in this network they are not working well that's why for example even if we stimulate just one point in the brain but then we see huge difference because it seems like it's it's trigger activity in all this network all this network become more aware of what it should do. And of course, brain networks, they work in interaction. That's why we have a so-called different functional states. So if we sleep, we have relaxation state. If you concentrate, it means concentration state, right? But of course, we all the time changing, even in uh, during this time sometimes our attention goes somewhere then it's come back again so it's quite normal and it should be like this it's called flexibility and uh, people with uh, autism they have no flexibility in the brain because their brain actually maturate too fast it maturates too fast uh, at very early stage at the early age and then it stop and because of there is no this flexibility, the processes of um, neuroplasticity, they are not anymore so effective. For them, it's really complicated to, to grow in the, uh, like the oldest brain networks in the right way. Because, for example, they also, um, because other networks, they maturate different time. Not everything happen at the same time. First, the child born, he has very simple things, what he can do, then slightly he start to focus attention, I mean, focus vision, his visual system creates more activity, he can understand, listen, he try to recognize faces, then he try to move, then he try to walk. It's mean that all different systems in the brain, they develop in different time. And, um, so if, uh, for example, one system develop and stuck, then other system, they also don't develop in the right way. That's why we may see some um, problem even with walking, with coordination, with some other things in the kids. And um, like I mentioned, so the, uh, neuronal development and this uh, networks, they develop in different time and uh, normally normally at one year old children uh, they should look like they should look like more or less like an adult so this is the adult person and this is 12 years normal child so okay of course they are different a little bit but they are quite okay if we will we, if we will be able to scan and do the same thing for children with different type of disabilities. You are going to see that this looks totally different. Yeah, this is also, I just show very briefly, um, this is Broadman areas. Um, of course, like even we know now that uh, every function, whatever we do, like language, for example, it means that if somebody doing scan of my brain at the moment, they are going to see that there's huge activity, everything working. But uh, still, uh, for example, if something happens, stroke happens, and then some function 
is not working anymore because a uh, specific area in the brain, like for example, this Broca area, 45, 44, now is not working properly. There is hemorrhage and it doesn't work. So that's why like the Brodman areas, they give us also some information about the symptoms. We can see from QEG, the deviation, we can see that, okay, in this part of the brain, uh, there is some uh, low activation, for example. Then we can go and uh, create uh, 3D maps and identify where this problem is come from, what this area is doing. And that's why sometimes we can um, almost uh, predict <laughs> the story from the parents because we know that if this part of the brain is not working properly, we could expect this type of symptoms. And um, this is just uh, to simplify. Like what happened if, for example, someone has a problem within visual network? So we have visual processing dysfunction. If someone has problem in auditory network, auditory dysfunction or central auditory processing. This is actually also one important thing to remember because autistic uh, kids sometimes mixed with people who has central auditory processing. And uh, this is a disease when the person, he can hear, but he simply can't understand. And imagine how frustrating it is. It's not because he is, um, not clever, let's say, or something, or his uh, development uh, has a very strong developmental disability, but he really do not understand what you are saying. You have to be very slow, very careful, repeat many times to help him to understand. So the same thing like uh, with attention dysfunction or depression, if we have in, in dorsal attention network some problem, we are going to have specific symptoms and so on. Yeah, uh, ADHD, like I say, considered to be neurodevelopmental disability. And I already mentioned that uh, they have different type of ADHD. Uh, at least three is here. Some people say there is seven. Uh, why it's important to know that they are different? Because it's different manifestation, like in, inattentive type, poor concentration, very easily distracted, very poor organization skill. But hyperactive, they also restless, they can't see it, they all the time talking, they're moving. And it's not because they misbehave, but they simply can't restrict themselves. Their system that suppressed that unwanted activity is not working. And then there is also combined time, then all of these symptoms, they are together. Neurological basis for ADHD. It's related with uh, problem in timing in development. In, in develop, development, uh, for example, these kids, they have delay in cortical thickness in frontal lobe. Um, so what it means that uh, when the mm, uh, child born then uh, and his brain developed, at some point uh, he should reach a uh, certain amount of neurons in certain areas. And for example, and this uh, creates the difference if you look at the fMRI, for example, you can really measure physically how thick this uh, brain, gray matter in the brain. And in case of ADHD, so they are behind of normal kids. So if you talk sometimes, if you hear sometimes recommendations from the doctor that please don't send your um, let's say seven year old ADHD child to the first class, let's wait. It's sometimes really reasonable because they need time to develop. And of course they have a problem in um, specific areas. I don't go there deeply. I can talk a lot about <laughs> that. Uh, so uh, they have some decreased volumes in certain areas and also problem with connectivity. Connectivity means that these distributed brain networks, what I told you, they sometimes they don't produce nice connections. For some reason, they, they are not wired good enough. That means connectivity. And uh, as I mentioned already, there are different types of subtypes and they're differently distributed in population. 
and uh, they can also come with uh, different type of um, uh, specific uh, manifestation like it can be anxiety it can be depression it can be aggressive behavior uh, yeah and now when we come back to the QEG as I said because um, there are so many different uh, stories and different kids we can identify specific phenotypes for ADHD it can be frontal slowing so then we need to probably activate the frontal areas it can be a um, problem with alpha waves it's specific waves in EEG range I can tell about this a little bit later it can be some paroxysmal activity or let's say uh, epileptic discharges in the brain so all of these things um, they tell us that uh, this person needs specific uh, treatment also from the medication point of view in um, Asperger or mm -hmm. autism disorders uh, like of course it's spectrum so we have different uh, type of disease within this umbrella and also we have endophenotypes so we can identify different type of frequencies in different type of um, EEG registered from the kids with autism and um, uh, it was identified about like six types at least uh, of autism with different type of um, QEG abnormalities which is also distributed differently on the map, on the QEG map. And also Asperger specific abnormality also. This helped us to read our results. It helped us to understand what we should treat and um, what type of outcome we can expect. Um, this is just also to a little bit uh, explain what's the difference between um, autism, ADHD, and for example, OCD. Even sometimes they can coexist in the same person. Uh, usually autistic people, uh, they have uh, hyper focus. It means that when they focus on something, uh, they have increased thickness. Like I say, in ADHD, not enough, um, let's say, gray matter they have in the brain, not enough uh, neurons at some point like they grow to the normal size in the case of autism it's totally different it's opposite problem and of course they also have a problem with connectivity which is logical if some area like amygdala for example is not working well so how this system is going to work and uh, neuronal system works so that if they fire together they wire together if it's at the same time some activity happen in different uh, in, in different parts of the brain so then they start working together they communicate yeah and uh, so this is about uh, qeg why it's important because non-invasive affordable we can say much much cheaper than any other technique and um, we can develop brain training protocol, different kind, neuromodulation protocol. We can also uh, do differential diagnostic. We can suggest some uh, psychopharmacological treatment. Uh, like, for example, in this um, slide, it's um, data from Dr. Daniel Amen approach. And uh, he broke the ADHD into the seven subtypes. And uh, also, he mentioned that um, what type of stimulus, what type of um, pharmacological treatment can be applied for these children, and why it's not working for one type or another. And imagine there are seven of them, so you have to try seven different drugs to your child. I don't think that parents they are really willing to do it, and usually medication has some specific effect. And what we really see, if it's also maybe important for um, parents to understand. So basically, when we registered EEG, we see this kind of stuff. So it's really uh, need some training and you really need to understand how to read EEG. So this is the different channels. So the different electrodes placed on the, on the head and then 
Uh, in normal case, we have this very nice looking EEG with beautiful waves, but if we have epileptic activity or some pathological EEG, it's going to look like this. And this is the good one. <laughs> it's still easy to read. And if we do just visual EEG analysis, so this is um, maximum what we can see. Normally, in neurological setting, um, neurologists, they're only looking for this kind of results. They just screen all recording, and if they see some pathological activity they identify, they say, okay, this is um, this type of epilepsy, or this is not epilepsy, but still pathological, is this, that, and so on. Or if it's not, uh, let's say, about uh, epileptic problems, or for example, someone has stroke, so we can have some abnormalities in the course of these uh, lines, and if it will be just purely neurological examination, they say, aha, uh -huh, okay, we have down regulation here, so probably stroke has happened in this part of the brain. Then they can send to fMRI. Yeah, and now about uh, the um, different brain waves, <laughs> I promised to tell. So um, when we talk about brain waves, it means that we try to separate this very complex um, recording into uh, different waves what exist inside. And we can identify different frequencies. So how slow it is. It can be very, very slow, and then it's delta. It can be a little bit faster, and then it's alpha or theta. And then it also can be beta and gamma waves. It's all important in QEG reading, because normally delta is fine. It's perfect. It should be in deep sleep. So that means that you are in deep sleep stage. People who doesn't have delta, adults uh, in, in this stage, they suffer from insomnia. Also theta, it's drowsy, it's dreams, it's good one. Also, in, um, even we have specific protocols in neurofeedback uh, to train people to produce more theta at specific areas if we are talking about art people, because they want to be more in their mind and creativity, so it can create creativity. It's a good one, right? But if it's too many, uh, too much, this kind of theta we see in person, it can be attention of cognitive impair impairment, so it can be a disease. Same with alpha and same with beta or gamma. We actually see quite a lot of um, very uh, high activity in children with autism. And as, as I told you, normally beta is very good. It means that you are concentrated, you are in the task, but imagine you are in the task all the time and just in one task. It means that you're exhausted. This person can't do anything anymore. It's also happened with anxiety. Actually, when you read QEG, if you don't know where it's come from, you can't say what's the disease under this. But we need to know something. I will show you later what I mean. And also uh, about functional brain states. Uh, if we, have, we also have uh, this registration, maybe for parents it's important to understand uh, why we're doing this eyes open, eyes closed, because normally the activity in the brain should change. So if we have um, open eyes, uh, we have more uh, fast activity, so we, we percept the world, we try to understand what's going on, we listen, we see, we taste, and so on. If we close our eyes, we go into the, let's say, relaxation or hibernate state, so our uh, brain produces more slow activity in the specific areas, especially like in the back of uh, our head, in occipital areas, and this is very good that we have this activity there. It means that the system is flexible, it's working totally perfect. But in case of developmental disabilities in many kinds of disease, um, this flexibility is not working, so we don't see the big difference between eyes open and eyes closed. And then it's indication for us that we should look deeper and we should understand what's going on, or it can be coexistent with our disease, uh, with our um, symptoms. And uh, in the future, when we do the second or third <laughs> QEG, we can see if this flexibility is better now. If it's better, usually parents say, oh, my child sleep better. Or if it's adults, you say, wow, now I like, feel better, I'm not so tense, and so on. 
so in uh, QEG, we can identify many things like I already mentioned. So we just simply uh, identify like spikes. We can create these kind of maps. So it's distribution of different brain waves in the brain. I just told you like that we can see different brain waves. And this is the example of this. So if we put ears here and nose here, <laughs> it's how this distributed. And different color telling us that uh, this is yellow. Big one is alpha waves. So the, the wave that should come when we relax. But if there are too many, it means the brain is distress. But there's something going on. Yeah, then uh, also we can uh, see. Okay. Uh, then we can also identify some um, specific um, source of pathological activity. We can, for example, if you measure the spikes, then we can identify where the spikes come from. And then we can say, aha, uh -huh, this, this child doesn't uh, learn because he has uh, abnormal activity in the area that is responsible for, for this um, action. So we can do some precise diagnostic and what is more besides that we only can do some distribution we also can compare EEG, uh, EEG and these maps with normative database you know like in blood test you come uh, you have some fever then you come to the doctor doctor take blood test and say aha so you have um, some infection because your uh, blood shows increased in this way or decreased in these like parameters uh, and to some degree it's always some degree so it can be let's say from uh, from five to six but in your case it's from it's like nine it's too much right so in this case we tell that there is something wrong more or less the same logic that's happened here so when we then we compare uh, QEG of the patient with normative database, we, we can see the difference. So these black dots, they show a difference, and it means that it's statistically significant difference from norm. So in this age, uh, in this condition, a uh, person of this age, um, sex shouldn't have this kind of activity in this area, or uh, he should less activity in this area. Of course, um, we don't uh, make uh, like diagnostic in this. It's just instrument for us to understand what type of therapy we should use. And that's the beauty of this. We are not going to uh, say, ah, oh, this uh, person has too much uh, beta activity, so it means that he is autistic. No, maybe he has something else, some other problem. Like, for example, after traumatic brain injuries, people can have increased beta activity for years maybe even for the, the rest of their life, but they are not going to feel any problems. Still, QEG will be abnormal. Uh, so, like, for example, here is um, a person with insomnia, possibly bipolar disorder, but also attention problem, emotion dysregulation symptoms, and uh, you can see that it's a lot of these black dots. So, a lot of things, they're not working properly. Difference between, um, for example, ADHD and depression, we can identify also by uh, this kind of um, coherence map. So how well different parts of the brain, they communicate with each other. And in many, uh, many cases, because the network is disintegrated, they don't work together well, they don't uh, communicate enough um, efficiently. So we can have some problem and in this case, again, we can develop specific protocol to address this issue and try to reconnect the different parts of the brain. Yeah, and now, like, for example, uh, differential diagnostic, like what we should treat. A uh, child with attention behavior was diagnosed with uh, dyslexia, was diagnosed with uh, ADHD, but has very clear pathological activity. So in his case, he needs neurologist mostly to take care about this problem. And then all other problem is going to disappear eventually. Or we can maybe apply some 
RTMS with very low frequency, like one hertz. Yeah, and then there is many other slides, so please tell me if you are very tired. <laughs> I, I can talk about this really very long. Hmm? Okay, so, so anyway, it's just more and more examples how we can use QEG and what it means. Like, for example, in this case, attention deficit disorder and attention, emotion control problem, fatigue. <laughs> so no hyperactivity, it's, it's just other symptoms. And uh, we can see that uh, there is some clear deviation in specific area, and we can uh, imagine what type of networks was disintegrated, which network in the brain is not working well enough. We can also identify in which part of the brain the problem is the biggest, and uh, then we can see which, what, what this area is actually responsible for, what is doing and to look into symptoms and try to understand it better. Yeah, paroxysmal activity, as I already mentioned, Asperger and um, ADHD and dyslexia, everything, all three diagnoses was in this child. And uh, as you can see, the, he has a lot of beta and gamma activity, very fast activity, which is often happen uh, if it's uh, extra, uh, tension in the brain and uh, maturation happened too fast. In his case, no flexibility, hard to switch attention from one point to another. And index of inattention in this case is going to be below one. So it's hyper focus, extreme. Like we saw already, it was like 15, right? Like 12, 6, but in this case, even lower. <laughs> Yeah, and then more and more slides <laughs> like this. So I just try to go down. Yeah, so with this, uh, our approach, like I mentioned, we can uh, do specific steps in analysis, and then we can recommend some medication if it's really needed, if doctor asks. Sometimes it's actually it's happened when, uh, if you work in a good relation with doctors, they also want to know how to help their patient better they just ask for QEG and say okay what do you think why it doesn't work and say okay because of this this and this so then they can change the uh, treatment uh, this can be also useful for psychotherapy because it's also a problem there they can't uh, uh, show uh, exactly to the people what's happened in their brain and sometimes our patients there they say well i don't know maybe it's help maybe it's not but if you show them picture and say look this was before and this was after it's really helped a lot yeah and of course for tdcs and rtms i think qeg is the must because this help also to understand what type of protocol you should use and uh, this just uh, some additional last <laughs> uh, example. This is actually what happened in the brain when we apply uh, electricity. So actually uh, in the studies that I mentioned somewhere in the beginning in the stem cells, um, if you don't stimulate this, this um, mere plates, uh, they develop, but they develop a very strange way. They don't are organized in the very beautiful networks. But if you start to stimulate the, this uh, neuronal progenitor cells, they start to develop really, really nice networks. Okay. Yeah, and it looks like this. If you uh, stimulate it, so they, they create this kind of uh, very strange, <laughs> okay, it's maybe strange looking, but it's really an organized network. And uh, if we don't stimulate, they just grow everywhere. So that's what I mean um, about the problem with, um, uh, with lack of communication between different areas, for example. So if they don't get enough stimulation at some point of time, they may grow in a very strange way. So they don't work how they should work. And then because the neuroplasticity at some point is not going to be as effective as in the early childhood, so it's going to be really hard to change the behavior of these people and change their life. That's why, of course, the early diagnostic is the, 
is the must. It's as early we know that something going on wrong, as more we can do with this and we can help people to recover and to live normal full life. Yes, okay. <laughs> so I will stop here. Um, just, yeah. Thank you very much for listening. And <laughs> Yeah, this is a good question, really. I think that it's all uh, lack of awareness of medical community. And uh, actually, it's a good thing at some point. Of course, I understand that <laughs> you maybe disagree with me because uh, the medicine should be conservative, right? We all want that when we come to the doctor, he knows what he's doing. So I think that's why they are very slow. So it's our job to convince them that it's really working. It's not some rocket science. Everybody can learn it. We can add it into the medical system and we can educate the people to do it. Uh, so, and we already have this databases that was uh, approved by FDA, for example. Uh, there are few in the market at the moment, not so many, of course, but uh, we don't need so much. So, but still, it's all just, uh, I think we need more effort. Like for, for example, recognition of RTMS for developmental disabilities, the same thing has happened with QEG. For some reason, we're still behind there. Like fMRI, they say, oh, wow, this is working. This is a good thing, but QEG, yeah. Just need more publication, more research, more, yeah, university people to work with that. And we're going to talk for about 20 minutes each, I think, about at-home TDCS. And I, I don't think I have to talk about why that's relevant or why that's important. I think that's been highlighted uh, quite a bit already. So what I want to talk about uh, more now is our device and uh, why it is the way it is. And I'd like to start that with a short history about uh, my own background. So. Uh, I come from medical equipment engineering, but I did my PhD in a field that's quite related to neurotechnology. And uh, this is me flying a drone using EEG. And I think uh, this realization that you can use your brain to interact with your surroundings directly uh, was quite a fascinating breakthrough for me. And, and we did a lot of these uh, sort of more fun usage of EEG. But then I drifted into uh, doing different type of at-home neuromodulation. You might recognize the device I'm wearing here. It's a terrible uh, gel electrode TDCS, not mentioning the name. Um, and what I realized was this is such an interesting technology. It can be used for so many different things. But the effect size means that you actually need to use it a lot. And uh, still on Wikipedia, this is how TDCS uh, looks. And at the time when I went into the field, TDCS had uh, this aesthetic. You go into a lab, someone straps these big things on your head, and there's a switchboard, normally a computer, to track the effects of the TDCS. And what we set out to do was to create an at-home device for TDCS, which was so user-friendly and so attractive a product that we wanted it to be a consumer product. We wanted to create a device that was so uh, attractive that anyone would go out and buy one for themselves. Because what we thought was, if this will ever be a successful technology, it needs to be very available. 
And the way we do that is by making a good consumer product. And I don't know if you can tell, I'm pretty nervous here. Um, we're training a new research assistant in using one of our early switchboards. And uh, there are a lot of things about this uh, first prototype that wasn't ideal. Um, so whenever we did this new prototype testing, it was on me. So if you can do any mistakes in TDCS, I've had them on my head. Um, then what we started doing was build what we uh, call prototype. So it's not a prototype, it's a provocation type where you make funny looking implementation of technology and you go out and you get people's feedback. And one of the things, people are very good at giving feedback if you uh, are provocating. If you bring something which is okay, they'll say it's okay. If you bring something which is ugly, they'll say this is ugly because of X, Y, and Z. So you get very good feedback that way. Uh, we even uh, through TDCS parties. So we invited uh, people along, you've got a drink and you could try on different prototypes to, uh, to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the technology. We also did a lot of media stunts uh, because another thing that we believe is the only way for technologies like TDCS to become mainstream is if people uh, know about them and are uh, confronted with the fact that using uh, electrical currents on your head is actually a great idea. So my co-founder, Morten uh, Fries Olivares in the top uh, right corner, and myself, we traveled the world, went to conferences with these prototypes on our heads, uh, went on radio, uh, newspapers, and tried to talk about the fact that uh, these devices are here. It's not something radical, it's actually very well documented in the science field. What we do differently is to make a device that people can use at home. We also did a lot of uh, user-centric design. So this is a, a design session with two designers uh, that used to work with us and a clinician, where we brought out uh, materials, devices, prototypes, and worked together with the clinician in developing uh, prototypes that led to the product we have today, which is Predator 2.0. Um, this is my personal one, so it's a little, um, it's a little worn, but if anyone wants to look at one, you can come and have a look. And the important part for me is that it's cloud enabled. So whenever someone uses a headset somewhere, we can look at how it's being used and we can provide that data to the clinicians that are using these products. So the app part is, uh, I would say becoming more and more important. And at some point, the, the physical device is only a small part of what we do. And the digital solution is actually where the main value is created for the users, uh, both the clinicians and the end uh, patient. Then when we had uh, finalized the Plato 2.0 product, we did a Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign and uh, sold some thousand devices to regular users. So not for medical use, but we did this for performance enhancement. And I think this was our final proof for ourselves that we had reached an implementation of TDCS that was so attractive that even uh, normal performance enhancers would uh, similar to this and that. So it's becoming more and more uh, acknowledged, which I think is great for the clinical use and for patients using it as well. The uh, design of the headset is based on the 1020 EG placement system. So it should be familiar to most people who are working with uh, neurotechnology. And it can be used in different ways on the head. So you can reach uh, more or less all the areas that we've seen uh, in the different mappings that have been provided today. Currently, we are a class one device, which means that it can be used to support any type of treatment. But we are working towards a uh, class 2A, which is a treatment specific um, device, which we hope that we will have that approval for this specific product next year. Uh, to me, the benefit with the class one is that you can still use the device for a number of uh, applications, as those of you in here who are already using our products know uh, quite well. We see so far four different types of usage in a medical context. So top left corner, uh, we see our heads is being used in consultation. So you have a clinician sitting together with the patient and providing it in clinic. Uh, we see 
in clinic usage where the, the patient comes to the clinic, gets the headset on, but the clinician leaves, freeing up time for the clinician. Then we have um, at home, which is that the patient will bring the product back home and use it regularly, either as a response. So for instance, in uh, addiction, uh, when you feel a strong crave, you can use the headset or you can use it on, on an ongoing basis, more as maintenance. And uh, the last bit, which I think is probably one of the more interesting bits, and Morton will come back to this in a second, is if you have a successful in-clinic treatment, you can give the product as a sort of a take-home product that you can keep using after you actually left the clinic and after you no longer have a relationship to the clinic and your clinician. And uh, in this fourth scenario, I think the, uh, the concept that you can do monitoring of the data from the headset and the patient and potentially pick up relapse before the patient is aware of it himself or herself and send a note to the clinician saying your former patient uh, is having a negative um, sort of behavior that might mean that a relapse is incoming and the clinician can pick up treatment much sooner. So then, Morten, about the feedback. Share my microphone. It is. Is there any feedback from this? No. Oh, is that the question? It does one. Okay, so my slides are very basic. So I'm going to be talking about, like, in a minute's time, I'm going to be talking about the different advantages there are to home use CCS and the different projects that we currently have on them. So. The main advantage of home use TVs is it allows for like a significant multiplier of clinician capacity. So if you're a single patient, you're limited to having one patient at a time in your clinic. So for example, in the case of a TMS clinic, you are limited to two or three sessions an hour. But in theory, with at home CDCS, you can multiply that to an arbitrarily high amount of simultaneous patients. It also allows for like a different kind of experimental design. So Classic TDCS research is that people come into the lab and they come into the lab daily for weeks and weeks and weeks. And that's incredibly expensive in terms of PhD students. It's really expensive in terms of research nurses and other like manpower resources that are needed. It's also really inconvenient for the patients or subjects because they have like daily transportation costs uh, and inconveniences. Um, and those like, limitations are to some extent like superseded or overcome with like at home TDCS usage. So currently, with like the current in-clinic research designs, this is a, from a review of a depression treatment with TDCS. And what we see is that as we in increase the total stimulation, so this can be higher intensity, more frequency, longer sessions, doesn't matter. All of those things multiply together into a unit called mega coulomb. So uh, as we increase just total TDCS, clinical effects increase. But there is a limitation to how far we can take this. And so far, the line is going up. But we don't really know how long it will continue to go up. And it's really interesting to find out how long it will continue to go up. And that's something that we can't, that can't be explored in these kinds of home-use TDCS paradigms. So where are we at with regards to home-use TDCS? Well, we've sold uh, a few thousand headsets. Um, and from those headsets, we've logged 35,000 online home use sessions, proving the feasibility of home use TDCS. These are people who've managed to finish uh, sessions. Most of them rate their session quite highly at five or four stars. And for research use, we have a fully fleshed out and customizable research app that provides both state-of-the-art standard stimulation, but also placebo stimulation. So stimulation designed to do randomized control trials. Uh, one of the users we're currently doing research in, or we have people doing research in, in collaboration with us, is uh, developmental disorders. This is uh, one slide from uh, uh, an ADHD study. Uh, and of course, we've heard about that a lot from Altikin today and from Olga. So I will just skip over this very quickly. One of the main areas of TTCS research in the past 20 years has been depression treatment. This is from uh, one of the earliest depression treatment studies by uh, Nietzsche in 2009 where they combine TDCS, fluxotine, which is a second generation antidepressant, and sham TDCS. And what they found is that the superior treatment over a three week period was uh, active TDCS with uh, antidepressants coming in a second. Uh, so current TDCS treatment uh, with, is in clinic, 
it's supervised and it's uh, limited to the acute phase. So while people are actively depressed and then they're sent home and whatever. Uh, but at home treatment, you can do it at home unsupervised and you can use it for acute and maintenance. So we've set up a couple of uh, research collaborations with a variety of research groups to examine exactly these points. Our, uh, the only study we have that is uh, finished or close to finishing is a collaboration with the Thessaloniki uh, Psychotherapy Clinic under uh, Dr. <laughs> Theodoros Katsumitsos. And he had uh, 40 patients with major, major uh, depressive disorder. And he did like a very standard setup with uh, of CDCS. And he did 21 days of uh, at home CDCS. And then a weekly psychotherapy session. And that was because he couldn't you know, justify having a complete sham group. So half the patients received psychotherapy, half the patients received active CDCS and psychotherapy. Uh, but then we used a, a customized version of our research app, so it only had one button. So people had an app that had exactly one button labeled stimulate. For half the people, stimulate meant real stimulation. For half the people, stimulate meant sham stimulation. And after three weeks of treatment, we have a significant decrease in the combined treatment group relative to the just psychotherapy group. And if we kind of look into these three weeks of, uh, of stimulation, we can see that for the first two weeks, they actually follow each other nicely. But then by the third week, there is a significant jump for the combined CDCS psychotherapy group. This has been shown in quite a few previous studies as well. That there seems to be like a, a, a treatment delay for CDCS. It's like there's a cumulative uh, neuroplastic effect. And if we look at the response to the revision rates, this you actually saw in uh, Alexander's slide as well. That was the one he put in as the effect of uh, combined psychotherapy and CDCS. So in the control group, control in this case meaning psychotherapy, there is a response rate of 5%. Response in this case meaning people who have a significant decrease in their depression scores, but not below the diagnostic threshold. So they're still depressed, but they're doing better now. Uh, that's 5% with 30% now being depression free. But in the combined treatment group, the response rate is 40% and the remission rate is 55%. So that's a significantly higher uh, response and uh, remission rate in the, in the combined treatment group relative to the uh, just psychotherapy treatment group. The next step for this experiment, uh, the Tessalonic experiment, is to do maintenance, which is one of the big open potential uses for TDCS, which is still under-researched. Uh, so over here we have two different what you call survival graphs. So that is where you have people who are initially healthy and then you follow them for some period of time and then you see how many develop depression again. Because the vast majority of people suffering from major depressive disorder, they will have like depressive episodes up to several times a year. But the difference between these two studies, which is two different CDCS studies, is that in this study they did... Uh, they did um, uh, TDCS, then they took the people who responded, the people who went into remission, and then they just followed them for six months while doing nothing else. And in this one, people continue doing weekly stimulation for six months. And at the end of the, well, you know, 24 weeks, roughly six months, that's five months, four months. And by the end of the, of the follow-up period in the study that just did no maintenance TDCS, we have around a 50% survival rate. So half the people went into relapse and were, were once again depressed. But in the maintenance, in the study that did an active maintenance condition, 75% of people remained out, non-depressed at the, at, the, at, the, at the final follow-up point. So in the, in the study with uh, Theodorus, we're going to be following, following for six months all the people that were responders in our uh, initial sample and see if we can replicate these findings. Of course, there are some major caveats in terms of like comparing data across studies. Like these are different experimental designs, but they are fundamentally similar. It wasn't a standard CDCS uh, treatment paradigm in the weeks leading up to, and then either stopping or continuing with weekly standard CDCS treatment. So quite promising. And definitely one of the big like growth spaces for CDCS use. Uh, then we have another study going on in depression, which is uh, currently recruiting patients. I think they've run four so far, which is in collaboration with uh, Istanbul Medical University, which is a private university in, well, surprise, surprise, Istanbul. They've recruited 40 uh, MDD patients, and they're doing like a standard protocol. We started both of these studies at the same time, but this one has been delayed by six months. So that's why the paradigms are very, very similar. Uh, the difference here is that we're going to be assessing a 
a buttload of different uh, psychometric uh, cognitive assessments in order to get a more detailed perspective of the different effects of TDCS in this population. So it's going to be very interesting. Maybe if we repeat this next year, we'll definitely have some data from this study as well. And lastly, we have a really big study that we're starting up with um, with the Trinity College Dublin, specifically with the, the Gillian Group. This is Claire Gillian of the Gillian Group. Um, there is a, quite a bit of research, quite a bit of literature at the moment, uh, working with people who are predisposed to depression. So we know at this point that if you have like a tendency to hyper-focus on negative thought, if you uh, think very poorly of yourself, if you you know, leave a party and you assume that people are talking negatively about you once you leave. Those kinds of like ruminatory thought patterns, we know that they strongly predispose you to, to depression. Um, the Gillian group, they've developed this app called Nureka, which is a population science app. So it's an app you download and then you can do a variety of tests, a variety of games that track cognitive development. And so far it has 65,000 downloads and they use that to make like large norm groups in terms of predicting development of depression and, and uh, Parkinson, Alzheimer's. They're working with those two demographics. So in young people, it's mainly about depression, later development of depression. And in the elderly, it's mainly about development of neurodegeneratory conditions of various forms. So what we're currently interested in, which is severely under-researched, is whether or not TDCS can be used in a preventive fashion. So if you have these people, and some of them are strongly predisposed due to a variety of different strongly negative thought patterns, can TDCS modulate these uh, cognitive biases and prevent the expected development of, of, uh, of, of, of depression? So we are uh, recruiting 100 healthy, but you know, high scoring, uh, so people who are strongly predisposed to, uh, to depression. Half of them are going to receive real stimulation, half of them are going to receive sham stimulation for, uh, for 28 days. And then we're going to look into a wide, wide variety of different uh, depression scores, subclinical depression scores, negative bias, negative cognitive bias scores, stuff like that. And we're going to see if we can modulate those using TDCS or if TDCS only really works when people are depressed or they have developed major depressive disorders. These are only people who've had no episodes previously. So they are not depressive patients. Uh, they're currently finishing the ethical approval and we're hoping to start data collection end of September. So very, very, very soon. This is Vanessa Teichentrup who will do the actual data collection, a postdoc. The other main area of research for us is addiction. Uh, as you saw from uh, Alexander Sachs' uh, presentation, there is currently class B evidence for the ability of TDCS to reduce cravings and uh, reduce the amount of drugs consumed by people suffering from a variety of addiction disorders. Uh, yeah, TDCS can reduce craving consumption, but also reduce relapse rates. So you can prevent people from relapsing into addiction. And this is, uh, but currently these studies are as again in clinic and they're limited in length and they're limited in scope. Also current studies have to rely on artificial cues. So in order to treat uh, cravings, what you do is that you induce cravings. So like, for example, you have someone who's a nicotine addict, you show them a picture of a cigarette in order to induce a craving state in the brain, and then you ask them to rate how much would you like a cigarette right now, they would really like a cigarette right now. And then you do some kind of intervention, and then again, you present them a picture of a cigarette, would you like a, a cigarette less now? And usually in these kinds of research uh, papers, it turns out they would like a cigarette slightly less now. So this is kind of like a standard uh, study design. You get some kind of cues, intervention cues, and then there are some more sessions here with no cues, and then a cue, intervention cue. And they get, in this case, a 47% reduction in craving in this random paper I just picked out of the pile. Um, but of course, the question is, is there a, maybe a strength to using a more ecological approach? So with at-home TDCS, people can have the headset at home, and then when they feel the craving, when there is a natural endogenous, naturally occurring state of craving, they can use the headset. And that's a study we're going to be running with the University Hospital Clinic of Barcelona, which is under the University of Barcelona. They are currently recruiting, uh, I think they've done six patients so far in the alcohol group, but they're recruiting uh, alcoholics, 
nicotine addict and a cannabis addict. They will, half of them will use TDACS at predefined time points, similar to what the standard current treatment paradigm is, and half of them will use TDCS when they feel like using TDCS, so when they feel a state of high craving. So it's worth noting there's no control group in this paper. Uh, this is mainly a feasibility study, is to see if people in an at-home setting are able to administer this on a per-need basis, as opposed to like predefined. Yeah, so craving will be assessed during uh, three clinic visits. And of course, the main thing that we're hoping to see is that when used in a more ecologically valid way, and when during endogenous craving, that there is a stronger craving prevention effect uh, in this population. And then lastly, there's the thing that we're hoping to achieve, or rather working towards achieving, which is that, as has been mentioned a few times so far, in terms of TDCS as maintenance, or TDCS as treatment, is that there are open questions with regards to duration of treatment. So TDCS treatment for depression is usually three weeks. And then we know that there is like a 50%, 40-50% response rate, 50% remission rate. Uh, with at home, we might see that there is a continuous increase in response rate if we go to four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, might be better. But what about chronic disorders? What about stuff like, for, well, for example, like repeated depressive episode or ADHD or autism or these things, which are lifelong disorders? Is the plan that people will do lifelong stimulation? So what we're hoping or what we're working towards and what we're designing is a system in which our app tracks a wide variety of metrics, and then those metrics indicate relapse danger, or they indicate symptom severity changes. And then from that, we prescribe stimulation. And that will mainly be our working focus going forward. Yeah, so that was the topic I had to uh, talk about. I think we're slightly under time, so that should help us uh, catch up to the program a little bit. So our current approval for like on-label use is above 18, but of course clinicians, yeah, for clinicians are free to use it off-label. There is quite a bit of evidence for child use at this point. So it's we recommend that it's only used under clinical supervision if it's used in the below 18 demographic. Yeah, nice. Right. That's largely related to current strength. Uh, Tell us from Brain Lab from Amy South We've been utilizing those science for the last uh, close to eight months now. And we've been treating as a Brain Lab basically a lot of our neurologists and medical doctors, which does supervision. We use a protocol with those science for 10 supervised sessions in clinic, half an hour, using a 1.6 million per. Usually, all the protocols based on Plato and uh, T. And uh, then, basically, we provide the device to have home use. We monitor through the cloud what they're doing on a daily basis as well. And what we've seen are uh, uh, great results by all these. In terms of people with chronic pain, insomnia, depression, neurologic, and fibromyalgia. Yeah. So we are very happy. We tried other products as well. We tried Fisher and Wallace. It's an American device, CES, but we had issues with that product because they were getting like optical flotations as well, and the increase in the current, and people were getting anxiety with what happening right now. Mm. We use another product here in the UK, but I don't want to mention it. It's based in Sweden. The problem with that one is the electrodes are quite big, it's in the left to right, but you can't work on things like patients, cravings, and all the other, like changing the long pilots. And um, yeah, so hopefully we have more access to the products. <laughs> Yeah, we, we just sold out, um, so some of our customers aren't too happy about that. But I think uh, in terms of the, for me, there's such an interesting balance between flexibility in design and reliability in usage. And I think sort of if you have a device that can only do one thing, then it limits your options. But if you have two electrodes that the user has to place 
him or herself, it doesn't really work. So it's about finding that sweet spot. And I think we've sort of managed to find at least a device that can offer a number of different protocols, but you know that the user gets the only codes in the right place. Do you have patients in stroke, cerebral region, very sympathetic and uh, inviting me it's a real pleasure and a joy for me to be here and uh, uh, being given the opportunity to um, share my experience about first of all to uh, gather so many information from this um, scientific world which is very peculiar and and so let me this bloody important because uh, neurological disorders of this kind are apparently increasing in number and uh, they, they are really widespread now. So I'm talking about uh, autism and um, unfortunately I happen um, to be a medical doctor, university professor, I teach human anatomy and uh, uh, despite that, uh, I was given a child, my son, he suffers from autism. So a few years ago, I already um, had the idea to, to try RTMS on him, which I started performing in the US. And um, the first results were quite uh, uh, impressive, striking. Uh, we are we're coming from the point where, where he didn't nearly say a word, a single word. And all of a sudden, he sort of unlocked some circuits and uh, started saying something, which was really impressive. Um, well, um, you guys are quite far away. That's why we, we, we came to finally know and um, visited London. It was a very a great thing, I must say. I must say because um, after just uh, this um, single session of um, stimulations, or uh, well, actually treatment, um, I can say there are some improvements in my child uh, lifestyle. A neurosis was um, treated straight away. I mean, by the day after the first treatment stimulation, it, it all stopped. He is now definitely more, slightly more sympathetic. Of course, some troubles like um, empathizing, Coping well, managing the any changes in to, to his uh, routine are still difficult, but he can he can now react in a different way. Uh, before this, he would be very nervous and um, react in um, expressing frustration, being more aggressive as well. He can now cope with these. Uh, 
feelings and keep calm. Yeah. It's not the same words and uh, sentences uh, we we did, couldn't even imagine. He, he, he knew. Okay. Of course, uh, as I've been say, it has been said this morning, earlier this morning, earlier today, um, by Ali. You have to do some sort of counterbalance uh, of the what you want to get because you can stimulate some area and maybe that's too much and, and maybe aggressivity comes up uh, and so you it all also depends on balancing what you want to uh, obtain as the immediate results or in the midterm uh, but definitely i'm pretty sure that um, uh, these these um, strategies are a real breakthrough and the capabilities are really immense, yeah. Um, if I may uh, take the chance and being here now, I would like to ask about the uh, electric stimulation. So what I'm, I was aware of um, until uh, up until a couple of years ago is that the, the, the results can be Evident for sure, but they are known to be, or were, they were known to be transient. So basically, uh, patients would need to be stimulated continuously. Uh, maybe these are uh, due to the lower intensity of the, of the um, action of the devices. But nevertheless, um, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that that technology is of great help as well. And so, thank you very much. I'm not gonna waste any more of your precious time. Um, of course, my son has already um, still maintained some behaviors which are quite problematic, like intermittent explosive disorders. But as I was saying before, uh, these are now happens very rarely compared to the past. Um, so, thank you all. Um, and, yeah. And the stage is yours. Thank you very much, thank you. Can you all hear me? Right, thank you very much. Uh, for reasons not under my control, I've been sort of promoted to the stage. I'm uh, not sure what happened, thank you for this. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Alp, for the invitation. Uh, I'll tell you the story. I've been working with QEG since 2010. Always wondered about the, the combination of QEG and TMS for 10, 12 years. And then I see this, first QEG guided. As you know, I was taking a train from London today, and today, the trains are not working for a line repair. So I was just waiting there to get here, 10 years waiting for this, just to get here. And I was delayed by that. So thank you very much for the invitation for the, uh, for the committee. And it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to talk to you today about, a bit more about the QEG, quantitative electrophotography, um, but especially as a narrow navigational tool, which I think is still missing. So I'll tell you about a, a sort of a, a more avant-garde algorithm for the QEG, which is called independent component analysis, which enables us to see, or at least uh, have an idea about subcortical sources of activity. And that can help us guide uh, the coil or in fact for TDCS. Um, I'm clinical director at London Scientific Neurotherapy. We tell people that we help them press play in their lives, get it, and not rewind. And we deal with very heavy cases of uh, trauma, especially they have a complex trauma and brain uh, damage. And we use neuromodulation techniques to help them rewire their brains, optimize their minds, and transform their lives. But my background is clinical psychology. I've done, I'm old enough to have done all the parkour from uh, uh, therapies, from uh, psychoanalytical, neuropsychology, neurophysiology, and I'm, I'm feeling the weight of all of that. And I'm very grateful for that. So I can integrate and I can tell you today, if Freud was alive, he'd be very, very excited. 
And so we are a Harley Street clinic and we offer a new paradigm for mental health. Uh, we step away from the DSM criteria for uh, analysis of behaviors. I'll tell you more about this. And we use the methods we've been discussing here for a while today. So I think the word that brings us here is precision, isn't it? Precision psychiatry, precision uh, medicine. In fact, precision, very precise methods to help us understand and guide our interventions with our patients. Now we have a problem though, because we are undergoing right now the most important revolution in mental health and mental illness in the last 130 years, since the times of, of the first diagnostic criteria. But no one is talking very much about it. It's sort of a secret. So in my seminars, and I do seminars for specialists, I'd like to ask how many, uh, to have an idea of my audience today, how many psychologists or specialists in mental health can I have today here? Okay, and the majority is family members or clients or TMS? Yes. Um, my drive has been, and I'll tell you why in a second, we need to have more people trained in the QEG because it's going to be, it is already the number one tool for the study of mental illness. And you'll see soon, very, very soon why. Now, the problem, however, at the moment is that we have QEG data and I have here three EEG recordings of three different people. And you may have a look and you, even if you don't have a trained eye, you'll see some differences, would you? Oh, I cannot use the pointer, can I? Do I have a pointer? Because I cannot, can I use this one without touching? It's just, just here, right? Yes. It doesn't touch this, yeah. right. So you may necessarily, for example, and I'm showing you this for the following reason. Let me guide you a bit into the investigation what I'm showing you today. And it is this, we have electrophysiological data, very complex. We are fast walking into neuromarkers, but still, still, and I heard you today many times, we still use DSM criteria to talk about the brain. So, three cases, very different. And you see, for example, here, a lot of beta spindling at CZ. There's a meaning to that. Here, you see some slowed alpha peak at T5 on this side. There's a meaning to that and also very fast EEG. These are all different individuals with the same diagnosis. And the diagnosis is OCD. So I hope you begin to see the drama from here that it's very difficult to still insist on the idea of putting a diagnosis, which is a confabulation, which I've created about 100 years ago and have been refined uh, successfully. But as you know, also the SM5 got into trouble a few years ago. And so we have to now turn our heads away from diagnosis, diagnostics in the old way, in the, uh, using the, the uh, observational behaviors, because those are subjective observations, and more and more learn about neuromarkers and biomarkers. So Sandra has a hot cingulate, excessive beta spindling. Sandra we used to feel so bad about herself that she would bathe in bleach just to get rid of those, those negative and, and the, the idea that I was very dirty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jane, who has a slow peak frequency, affects the posterior temporals. She has less, relatively less symptoms of OCD, but she's still diagnosed. And Bruce, who has none of that, but has a low voltage fast EEG, which our dear Olga today mentioned in her presentation. So if you look at the maps, I'm not sure if you can see that, but when we do a spectral analysis, we just compress the averages of the whole recording and we'll obtain these maps. So the first line will be the graph on the left, second line on the right, all the way down the lines to the occipital sides here. But you can see probably here the amplitude, the staggering amplitude of beta spindling, which then, by the way, was being medicated as standard on an NHS by benzodiazepines. Some of you may know what this means, I see it all reacting, which also increases in terms of brain what this patient was already suffering. So you see the map there. Now this is all surface data. I'm showing you this, surface means cortical data. 
And the purpose of this presentation is to show you how we can go subcortically. So to better guide our TMS, TDCS devices, etc. In this case, also OCD, it's a slow off a peak at about 7.5, and you see it especially there, affecting both T5, T6, posterior temporals. And Bruce was very interesting because he came to us on the first day for the recording and said, well, I smoked a spliff. Spliff. Uh, because that's how I handle, how I feel. Constantly, severely anxious. Now, Bruce, you have to come back in two weeks because we cannot assess you whilst doing marijuana. But in this case, you can see here, uh, very slow frequencies at CZ, which modulates emotions, as you know. We see also a very fast alpha peak. We almost don't see it, but we know it's there at 1099 for his age, especially because he's almost 70 years old. And also another marker for, in this case, occipital fast alpha peak. The, the alpha peak, I'll be talking about it a lot today because it's like, imagine the alpha peak is a sampling rate of the brain. Packets of information are being sent from the thalamus to the cortex and from the cortex back to the thalamus. 10 times 10 cycles per second. So one cycle per second is this, two cycles, four cycles, I imagine 10. Now, if my sampling rate is very slow, things will happen in front of me which I'll not be able to the process because it went by and I, was, I had my gate closed. If it's too fast, it's the same, I don't even see it. So it's a very important marker and I'll be talking about it today a lot because it has implications for TMS and TDCS. So what we're discussing here is, uh, it's called now deep phenotyping. Phenotypes is ex external appearance. Deep phenotyping is about what's happening inside. Morphology of brain waves. What are the differences? Networks. You don't see it from the outside, but they're all lurking inside. And now with the QEG, we have access to all that information. And we begin with a question. If I want to work with TMS, um, colleagues, I need to see what they need. And I just caught this paper from uh, Paul Fitzgerald, very recent in brain stimulation, and he asks, do we really know what we are stimulating and how best to do it? So let's use this paper to then enter as a portal into my uh, next uh, minutes with you. So what we're doing here is we want to enhance precision and efficacy. That's, that's what this presentation is about. And I went to his abstract and he says, one method to enhance the efficacy is through improvement of methods of stimulation and localization. This is exactly what we want and want to promote and know more about. And the methods, neuronavigational methods, which was in the title of this presentation, are generally most, most likely to consistently ensure placement of DMS coils such that it results in stimulation of a selected cortical site. So, so far, the work I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is about cortical sites, not subcortical. So, fMRI, connectivity, they help target specific circuits, right? But it may not be possible to demonstrate specific differences between one method and the other. So let's see if we today, we can make some way forward into this and learn a bit more. So what is, again, what, is, what are we doing here? So far, the information is mostly cortical, surface of the brain. But if you want to enhance specificity, sorry, don't see that, it says cortical surface, the red, we want to know more about subcortical deeper structures and use this information to be more precise in our approach. So on the one hand, TMS clinicians and researchers, they need more precision. Correct, we have established that. So, the question is, can the QEG deliver a higher precision and how? So again, I have to bring this concept back. I mean, we have abandoned the DSM-based diagnostic criteria and categories. They are subjective observations of symptoms. They create enormous problems across cultures when they are applied. Uh, issues of validation, you know. It. So this is why to enable researchers to move on to neuromarkers, and neuromarkers mean objective measurement of brain dysfunction. Now we have this. So earlier I was, I was listening to colleagues say, well, the EEG is very important, I agree completely. 
But we're talking like it's something, it's a niche market or a niche activity. Well, no more. As of 2013, almost 10 years ago, the National Institute of Mental Health developed, presented, and is disseminating a completely new framework for mental illness. Out of 10 specialists coming to my workshops, one may know about it. It's not in the media. Why is this relevant to us? Because it's presenting a completely new approach. Here's the research domain criteria framework. It means that the NIMH no longer finances DSM-based studies. That's very important. And we have all of these different domains, units of analysis. I mean, it's talking about development. All of a sudden, lifespan. This is the stuff I could have dreamed of when I was studying psychology two centuries ago. Now it's a reality and it's official. And we need to understand this, all of us, specialists, from whatever angle we come in, things are changing. Now, why is it so important? Of course, environment is also playing a role here. And I was listening to my colleagues earlier. I'd like to hear more about the environment, social interaction, psychoeducation, that has a role. We cannot continue to say I'm depressed because of nothing. There's a gene in me, not really. Something happened to me in my life. Let's find out about that. So we have to also bring the information in our assessments. Anyway, what I'd like to show you now is that the different un units of analysis includes the, the list I have here, but especially circuits, brain, physiology, behaviors, and self-reports. This is the stuff of psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists. And it's not open as a framework for us to work with, official framework. It is important because the NIMH is a bit like the Fed reserves when it comes to uh, uh, money policy for the whole world. They tend to adopt what the Fed reserves says. The NIMH has the same power. So very soon you'll see the adoption of these frameworks more and more, especially the new generations. Now, oh, something happened that I, what I meant to show you here, but it disappeared, is that the EEG is now an official official unit of analysis of the NIMH research doc framework. This is very, very important. It is used in this framework. Of course, I have to mention the psychologist that I'm very happy about this, but it does echo something called the biopsychosocial uh, approach for, for, for psychology and mental health in the 70s by someone called George Engel who then published in Science the idea that we have to bring into account biological, sociological, environmental factors onto our studies about mental illness. And so it was then, and I'm very pleased to see that the NIMH now presents echoes of that. So the RDOC is not meant to serve, this is from their website, is not meant to serve as a diagnostic guide, nor to replace current diagnostic systems. We just better stay away from these disputes here on the side. However, we want to understand the nature of mental health and illness, right? I like this because one thing is what is happening in the brain. Another thing is what we think is happening in the brain. And neuromarkers and biomarkers bring us closer to what actually is happening in the brain. Therefore, giving us a higher chance of improving the health outcomes. Oh, here it is. So. If you go to units of analysis, you see that the EEG is now listed in the framework. Uh, it's important, again, because so far the EEG was seen as a tool for neurology. Who was a psychiatrist, by the way. Anyway, that's another story. But it's not listed here. And not only that, but also ERPs. So both tools that we use every day in our clinics. I think Personally, you may, you may or not uh, agree with me, it means that the QEG is now transitioning from a niche tool to a mainstream tool. And all we need now is to do our, put our hands together and heads together to train as many people as possible and make the QEG simply standard, standard practice and gold standard. And that means that the, the QEG is therefore an assessment tool for the objective measurement of brain dysfunction and it serves the field of neuromodulation, which then includes a number of disciplines. It can be neurofeedback or neuroregulation, as I prefer to call it. It can be TMS or RTMS, TDCS, photobiomodulation, 
so on and so forth. All departing from not what we think the person has, that's the DSM thinking. We now move on to uh, analyzing the biomarkers and the neuromarkers and using those to then design the treatments we think will be helpful, uh, be helpful for the person. So the, the levels of analysis now we have is this, we call it deep phenotyping, as I said earlier, that includes neural signatures and neural markers. That is a step above the genotype and all that DNA information, which in principle psychologists do not work with, but they do and they can work with deep phenotype. And then the observable physical properties of an organism, which is just the appearance and the user information to classify it. That's the past and that's probably the past as well. So I like the way nature put it in 2015, as the deeper you go, the more you know. This is what the tools that we have now in our hands to go in that direction, deep phenotyping. I just want to define mental disorder with everyone here, if you don't mind. And if you go to the standard definition of the WHO, is a clinically significant disturbance in individual cognition, blah, 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 blah. Is everyone happy with this definition or is anyone unhappy with it? I'm very unhappy with it. Anyone else? You're, are you awake? The problem is that I don't see the person's role here. It's always something happening to them. I'm the doctor and I know what's happening to them. I rather prefer what we've been working with, which is mental disorder is the loss of ability to self-regulate. To self that also opens the door to use the QEG to instruct, to teach the person things about their own brains. That will then feed back into their involvement to the treatment. That is also very important. You all ready to see my alpha peak frequency? That's a neuromarker. I'll share mine. This is very important. I hope you appreciate it. So here we have my alpha peak frequency, 0102. It's quite decent, that's why I show it to you. 10 hertz, statistically, very nice. A bit of over arousal here, but you can live with it. Okay, that's fine. Just, just a, a normative element. I don't think, see myself as a normative, but just to show you what an alpha peak frequency looks like. How do we obtain this? It's simply this, the person, this is eyes closed, the person is closing their eyes. Information does not reach the occipital sites. It's, so it, it's not processing and then it's idling. So alpha goes up. And that's a natural, and probably one of the most important natural neuromarkers we have to begin with. So when I teach, I say, like checking the oil in the car, you just go and look at the alpha peak. All the rest could be then uh, observed from this perspective. And now I'll show you my alpha peak during COVID or after COVID. And you see it's gone down to 9.5, 9.2 frequency. Uh, 10 days. And I could feel it because if my alpha peak is slowed down, my sampling rate is slower down, is slowed down as well, so I, I have difficulty in following things. Not as much, it's not as slow as that, but I can say, it's just to show you how sensitive this marker is. This will have huge impact on TMS and TDCS therapeutic options, as you'll see in a second. Let's look at first, how does the individual alpha peak frequency and medication response, how do they relate? And these are studies as, uh, oldest from 1984, when they found out that non-responders to antidepressant medication showed a posterior slower alpha peak. So those of us with a slower alpha peak, much, much slower than uh, the nine I was showing you during COVID, will not respond to medication. And we need to know this, so this is the first advantage of the EEG as I'm presenting it to, to you today. Let's look at the alpha peak frequency. Also, the response to medication did exhibit an increase in individual alpha peak, suggesting that antidepressants do increase the IAFP, but only in patients who already had a normal IAFP. Is it me, or do you agree it's a critical marker to have a look at? Especially when we're trying to screen who is going to be okay to TMS or TDCS or not. Now let's look at alpha peak frequency and RTMS response. We have some studies. So a study employing uh, 10 Hertz RTMS over the left frontal cortex, 
the good old left frontal cortex, reported a significant increase on, on alpha peak frequency, but it lasted for two minutes only. But this is a long time ago. This is from 2001. A lot of research has been published since then. But just to show you that this is the first time I think that we found that there was an implication of a coil 10 hertz and the alpha peak was immediately enhanced. However, non-responders to RTMS were characterized by a slow alpha peak. That's why they would not respond to the treatment, suggesting that regular RTMS is unlikely to help this subgroup. So it's essential, I think, to at least know what's happening inside the brains, find out about this neuromarker, and then say, well, with this person, this is less likely. Of course, it's much more complex than this, but just to give you an idea of the power of this marker, that's from Ar Martin Ardens uh, in 2010. Back to my alpha peak frequency, and I'm going to show you a kid, 14 years old, with learning difficulties, which is the context of this, uh, our talk today, our conference. And this kid has, sorry, it's not about that. Can you see what's happening here? If you manage to see the scales. Let me help you. I want about 10 hertz, sorry, 10 uh, milliamps. This kid is on a thousand. That means that all of his attention is turned out to the outside. That's a marker for severe, but I'll tell you, severe, severe anxiety. It just goes around his day. You don't see it unless you see the, of course, from his behavior, you'll see what's going on. But you don't know what it is until you see the EG. A thousand in power. That means the number of neurons are being recruited like a football stadium. They're all clapping at the same time. Another one here, this is a 16 year old male, peak frequency, very high also, this is 80. The other one was a thousand, remember. And you have a peak frequency, the frequency and amplitude, remember. Faster frequency, nine, 10 is faster than eight cycles per second, right? But we're talking now amplitude also, 80, and also the frequency has come down to 8.2 in a 16-year-old male. So you have the classic ADD, procrastination, loss of uh, inability, impulse control, all of that in one, in the same bag. Now, okay, so we alpha peak, right? Now let's move forward towards the end of this presentation already, which is how do we then go, can go even beyond that and give, provide more specific information? We we'll use independent component analysis. And that's a signal processing method that separates sources of, of information. So imagine a huge football stadium, everyone is shouting and, 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 uh, and clapping, and you have 19 channels on top of the stadium, and you can hear that conversation over there, which is very distinct, the shouting on the left, the referees over here, and then you can separate that signal and find that, okay, this signal here comes from there, the other one comes from over there, and you have the possibility of investigating subcortical sources of information using that method. And we do it, this is an example, we do it, I use two methods for this, uh, two um, softwares. This is the MITSAR, we need G, and also is the iSync Wave, which we'll now be talking about today after I finish this presentation. And what it does, again, it separates. For example, here, it's showing you, this is the raw EEG, it shows you a blink. A blink is not brain data, it's just the muscles around the eyes. Okay, but it gets recorded anyway, so the data needs to be treated. And this uh, algorithm separates, corrects, so raw, corrected, and then excluded. And you see how the blink affects the whole, all the other sensors. And because it's the most important one in terms of amplitude, it shows up here on top of the list. Each of these are components which have been separated. So you can do this in two moments. One, to separate and, and clean, so to speak, the, uh, the um, artifacts blinking, lateral eye movement, things like that, muscle tension. And when you do that, you run it a second time and you find out what's happening here and where does it come from? From the cingulate, from the cocooneus, you can find out using this method. And you can see it here. Again, some idea, you can separate and then have access to subcortical sources of information. The other method I use is uh, the iSync waves. This is the dry sensors, a phenomenal piece of equipment because what they've done is the best of both worlds. They have incorporated database comparisons, but also incorporated ICA components. 
this is a normal, I've covered the client names here, but what I then can show you is that this will be the surface map, surface, uh, surface map, sorry, ma uh, maps, six hertz a bit there, seven hertz, a bit of fast um, uh, beta frequency frontally, but with a component which gets isolated, I can then go much deeper. I get the tomographies and I see, for example, all these, so five, 10 hertz, these are slow frequencies here, which show in terms of surface, they show central um, frontally, but then I can obtain, let me see if I have it here, the tomographies and shows me the depth where they are, midline, singular, that means emotional regulation, and I get M and I coordinates, which can probably can be imputed in the TMS devices to orient and uh, neuro navigate to the actual site we want to impact. Another example, what you have here is another component and you see it showing higher amplitude. These are theta frequencies, a bit of alpha two, but my point to show you this is that it's showing in terms of surface on the left temporal and even lower on this side. However, when you run with S. Loretta and get the, uh, so it's mostly theta frequencies, uh, they are seen cortically left temporally and above a bit, but with a probable subcortical origin in the anterior singlet. So let's run the Loretta and you see it here. Now the idea is if it's showing here, but it's coming from somewhere else, that will of course influence the way we direct again the coil and use uh, TDCS for this patient. Uh, ICA has strong, strong support in the literature. If you run a, uh, PAMED run, so I have here uh, EEG and ICA, 1,076 papers already published in this direction. So it's a growing, growing uh, area of research. And now I'm going to give you some more examples, two or three, where we use ICA to find out where the uh, subcortical source of information uh, signal is coming from. 15-year-old male, I showed you his uh, alpha peak earlier, slowed alpha peak. The surface ma maps are, yeah, you, with experience you can interpret them, but I'd like to compare this with something else, which is the actual component. So here you see, okay, this is the alpha, precunius. This is the hub of the default mode network. So this child is absolutely slowed down the liquid behaviors, uh, impulse control, all of that. And you can see the graph here where you see all the slow frequencies and the actual peak, which is well below 10 Hertz. With this, you can locate where the alpha is. Now, in this same child, you could have several alpha sources. So you'll have to find the one that is more, it will be representing what is happening with this child. So several components will help. Same child, slow frequencies here, theta and delta, all showing at CZ, middle of the brain here, surface. When you look at the component, in terms of topographies, you see that it's down below, but much deeper, again, the mid singlet. This will have a num another number of implications for his behavior. And again, uh, the final one for this kid, frontal, the same slow frequencies, because essentially this kid had a very slow down brain, slowed off the peak and very fast beta spindles, all in one brain. So imagine that, it's like a rodeo every day to live in such circumstances. So, and there you are again, getting the uh, coordinates that can help us direct and neuro navigate uh, with, with TMS or TDCS. Um, I think two more examples, a 13 year old uh, girl withdrawn, depressed with mutism, for about two weeks, she would sit with me in session. I'm quite talkative and I tend to open space with people. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy with that. She did not open her mouth. And you think, is she a bad girl? No, I'll tell you why she wouldn't. Surface maps, it did show a fast alpha peak. So not a bad candidate for TMS. And it did show uh, theta frequencies frontally, but then the component will show you two things beta and alpha theta in the same area of the brain. Now, up regulation, down regulation. 
hot singlet, cold singlet in the same brain. But most importantly, revelation that yes, it's all happening in terms of anterior singlet, but essentially broadband area 25, which is a hell of a weight to shift in terms of, of feeling depressed. I don't think she was even depressed. She was just disengaged and, and wouldn't speak at all. So now we know why. So all this information again could help us orient. Um, one more, um, Ari. These are keys that I just put together because of the uh, scope of the conference, learning difficulties. 12 weeks premature, um, soft cleft palate and I squared, reported developmental challenges, including communication, lack of focus, finer and gross skills, communication skills, sensory issues, parents report OCD symptoms and tics, all in one little girl who's 12 years old. In apparent impulse control issues, drooling, etc. The medication she was getting was, of course, good old bacillus finidate, but it, this was addressing the frontal part of the brain in the theta waves. She had a massive slow down alpha peak frequency, so that was not being addressed. Confusing, isn't it? Because she's taking the medication, parents think they're doing the best, but it's not working. And this helped us see why. And there you are. Look at the, uh, another component for her, alpha, occipital, as expected, all fine, but look at the slow down alpha that you see here. So it's very easy to confound this girl with ASD, Asperger's, all of those little titles or huge titles that bear a lot of weight and have huge impact on the minds of the person and their family members. But this is what really, what was happening in her case. Another component, more or less same story, parietal, sensory integration, very difficult, you see why, very slow, a lot of slow frequencies over here, parietal sides, left parietal, and also frontally, a mix of beta and slow waves, all affecting the frontal lobe. Coordinates again. So we began asking, can we help TDMS? I hope you agree that we can within this framework, EG, QEG, a lot of value. And just to finalize, I mean, we're back to where we are now, which is identifying, Olga was mentioned that, the different networks, and then seeing what is the AICA able to identify in terms of subcortical activity that matches one of these, or several, in fact. And so, for example, here, just for the sake of example, yes, and your cingulate, you see it affected there, and, the, and you also see it here. So maybe in that case, there's a point that I want to come back. Um, I think uh, I go back to you a lot, Olga, because it's, it's so much to do with what I'm doing here. I'm so glad you're here, by the way. Um, where do we start? All these diagnoses, my experience is I always start with anxiety because developmentally, that little amygdala had something happening to it and all the rest, ADHD, a lot of stuff, not neurodevelopmental, the other ones, are most likely to be a consequence. So a frontal lobe which is not connected, it's singular, it's all of that going upwards in terms of development. So um, I'll take it that way. So summary, I suggesting, I'm suggesting to you today that the QEG qualifies as a key pre-assessment technique for the design of TMS interventions. It's useful for screening in non-respondent cases for, um, with low uh, alpha peak frequencies. And it may provide NMI coordinates uh, to enhance precision of TMS interventions which is the aim that we had here, which is a tool for neural navigation. Uh, you can find out about what we do at a website here. That's, uh, that's Facebook, by the way, and uh, Instagram, and the website where we have you know, our courses, uh, regular courses. I go around the world teaching these techniques, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? That's, that's a bad sign. <laughs> yes. Hello. For reasons QEG for sensitivity specificity, we've had the website where we 
fine focal size, we place yeah. it, it ranges from 40% to 72%. This is epilepsy, which is found basically using a free Tesla MRI. They use a PEG and the sensitivity to have a correlation with the findings on the MRI is only 42 to 72 percent. What specificity and sensitivity does this have on mental conditions? Remember, we're not being specific diagnosis. We have to drop that idea for good. I'm not responding to the SM. We shouldn't. So if I bring in the patient on three different days and using the same mapping, will I have the same results for three different days? Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, you, I'll show you my alpha peak. Yeah, right, right. I'm sorry. I didn't. I'll show you my alpha peak after COVID. It did show it. Life is happening to us all the time. We have extremely sensitive nervous systems, all of us. So it is reacting, of course. Yes, depending. I was um, many years ago. I was, I was um, doing the QG of a colleague of mine, and then he got a phone call in the middle. And I could see his alpha peak just went double because of the phone call. So yes, the idea that it should be the same from now to two weeks. I don't see it. What do we get from it in terms of science? Say so it's very sturdy, the technology? Those are habits we have been using for a long time. So if I do your QG now and, and tomorrow morning, it may be different. Not radically different, but we'll see some differences. And imagine now over the years, right? So I'm, I'm happy with that. Sometimes we need uh, both from the recording for a few days to just uh, get the speed. But that's why it's not probably also the exactly the same results. Of course, if you are going to have some kind of stroke or something, or something wrong in the brain, more or less stable, but this is such a condition. And depending on the type of approach, you are going to have different stories. Uh, this, that's why maybe yeah. exactly all these days is not the best time. Even more, sometimes I work in this project with the person, so I have a little bit of a problem. You see, sometimes you need to do operation, place some healing dots inside the area of the thing that is supposed to be produced this box. Before we can do any neurosurgical operation, we need to see. Because this is something that's also. I'm a neurosurgeon, sorry. Thank you, Olga. Sorry, those are more radical cases, right? The ones that go to, for surgery. Yeah, yeah. Those are. This is all, but I just write yeah. that it's not always possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if that's the case. Our neurosurgeon team, basically, for oncology, for brain oncology, and epilepsy. We have uh, basically during surgery, we have a mapping using ultrasonic guide, along with the findings we have as a software from the MRI. And we have a real time, as we said, QEG to find what's happening in real time during the surgical procedure and to see the reaction. And we have a constant EEG size of the body reaction of the spinal cord. So we're going, to, we have, we're going to have findings, basically, we already have findings, but we're going to have a publication using these three technologies in the next, basically, six to nine months from our neurosurgical team and our neurophysiological team. And, uh, yeah, that's... So you're, monitor, you're monitoring the spikes? Tumors, um, stroke, neurologic stroke, but not say cognitive, resp cognitive response, for example. I'd be more interested in see are we touching something that we should be touching? Can you, that would be interesting to monitor. Yes, thank you very much for a very clear presentation. I just have two short comments, one, one positive one and one more critical. Um, the QEG, I think, is indeed, like we've heard many times now, a very, very powerful tool. And I fully agree with a lot of things that you said that we should use it more also in the context of uh, many of the things you discussed. Um, my experience is the incredible temporal resolution of the QEG and the ability to look at oscillatory parameters like the individual alpha wave. Actually, I couldn't agree more with what we found. It's similar to what we find. And we also looked into that, into TMS responders. And indeed, the only predictor 
So it's not my finding at all. This is established in the EU literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not my finding. Yeah, I see it, but yes. So we also see that the patient that responds positive to the ten hertz standard treatment are those that are closest, let's say, when it comes to their peak alpha frequency around that ten hertz, and the more they deviate from this, the less they are treatment. Yes. The less is their treatment response. And they could, you could think about what that means. It could also mean that maybe if somebody has a 10 hertz individual alpha peak frequency, this is then what the 10 hertz treatment frequency is also in training and therefore um, uh, having better effects. So this is all like wonderful. Um, where I'm a bit let's say, skeptical about is what you what you said about that could be uh, helpful in positioning the TMS code, in being a navigation help. Because I do a lot of MRI guidance and neural navigation. And there, of course, we have the spatial map. You know, it's millimeter, sub millimeter precision from the FMI. I know exactly sub cortical cortical where it, where it lies. And it would be so wonderful if this very expensive and unpractical assessment could be replaced by a 2 d The problem with the idea that I see, but maybe you can correct me, is that, you know, the localization of sub cortical structure that we present is based on the source localization software. So it's a kind of mathematical modeling, an assumption where the source comes from. It's not clear it comes from there. That's Correct. why you also say it's probably this or that. But even if that problem wouldn't exist, that is a big problem that does exist, but let's ignore it for now as a raw experiment. If you would really have to support the source you want to target, I cannot reach it with games. I cannot simulate it. So still, I would need a cortical entry that I need to know how to get there, and then I'm back again at yeah. the image. Wonderful, right? Correct. This is why then we go back to the neural networks that we are working with, and we see that this is part of that network, and I probably can access some part of that network, not subcortically, but cortically in another place. That would be the idea, right? Because, of course, you cannot go subcortically. Yeah, but then it would be a way to get from That's why I mentioned. Position, position like individual case, but all that general network. Uh, yeah, well, there's another element, which is a 14-page you know, clinical history. Because remember, the software will give me uh, 19, 19 components. It's up to me then to find out from the person's history, clinical history, and what's happening with them and how they behave, their reports, family reports, which ones would be more relevant or not. So that also helps, because not all of them will be relevant. So it's, it's never easy. <laughs> Well, thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Both. Both. No. Correct. Correct. Also, I'm, I'm a psychologist, you see, people want, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with attachment issues in everyone. <laughs> we need a person, we need someone, a presence to talk to a, a client. Uh, so I'm not a complete fan of the complete AI, AI uh, argument because the, we have to understand what's happening there. But that's my view. We were in a very deep discussion with that, but... Are we having it? Any other questions? Yes or no? Uh, Dr. Dave, do you want to... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I'm uh, Dave Kim from uh, I Medicine Company based in, based in Seoul, Korea, South Korea, and I'm very happy to join this meeting. And I'm very thank, thank you very much for this con, this program committee, because uh, I think it is very uh, precious group because autism is very difficult to treat, but this group is most advanced group for treating autism and developmental disorder. I think so. I think it is very honored to this, this very important group, uh, join this important group, present my stuff. Uh, thank, you for, thank you so much for your invitation. And 
my, our company basically developed the two easy guided AI digital mental health platform. I am a Icing Wave project leader and also director of Corporate Research Institute. Uh, this device, Icing Wave, and we, our catchphrase is just 10 minutes. When we uh, record the EEG and we can find our QEG personal profile just in, just in five minutes usually, and another five minutes we can target the specific specific area to activate or uh, deactivate our problem area using the photobiomodulation or neurofeedback integrated in this device. So five minute assessment and five minute treatment in the daily life using this wearable device can change the mental health area. That's our catchphrase, ten, just 10 minutes. Uh, I'd like to briefly uh, overview our company and our product, and then I, I, will, I would like to have one volunteer to test five-minute assessment in here. Yes, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So our company, the basic expertise is AI brain scanning and analytics and developing biomarker. We have 50 employees. We have a 4K FDA and one FDA. One FDA is this device. Uh, another three FDA, KFDA is software medical device. That's machine learning algorithm detecting the early, early phase of the Alzheimer's dementia and the detecting the uh, HLV, in HLV stress profile and detecting the normative comparison of QEG software is the another K, K, KFDA software. Basically, we have uh, iSync Wave assessment and treatment device and the cloud-based AI automatic analysis software platform. And also we have, we develop many kind of uh, early prediction machine learning biobanker, the first uh, Post commercialized and the government uh, government uh, keep the reimbursement code is the MCI classifier for early detection of a mild cognitive impairment using I think wave device. That's the uh, our biomark uh, main biomarker. We develop another many biomarker at this moment. Uh, second one is the brain age biomarker for child and other adolescent. And third one is early prediction of depression now will be integrated in this platform. And our company start from the uh, national database, database center for Korean EEG. We collected eight, uh, 1800 normal population data for eight years. It takes a lot of time because we all participants pass through two hours of the screening test to determine this person is in real normalcy. We use the neurocognitive pathology, we use the uh, emotional, emotional questionnaire, we use the behavioral profile. So after two hours screening, we, the participant get into, involved in the database project. So it takes eight years. After eight years database collection, we started the AI machine learning software platform because uh, without automatic analysis, the clinician in the mainstream, mainstream medical doctor cannot use EEG. Brainwave is very informative data, but clean da cleaning the EEG data is very important, but it takes a lot of signal processing, but conventional medical, medical doctor and medical in medical situation Manual denoising is very difficult, time consuming. It cannot be make, it cannot be make easy clinical, clinical application practical. So we developed AI automatic denoising and analysis engine ap after we developing the database. And ap finally we, uh, we made 
the MCI classifier because the neurologist, uh, neurologist uh, only epileptologist use EEG, but neurologist carrying the cognitive issue don't use the EEG. But using our MCI classifier, neurologist easily detect the early possible Alzheimer possible population. So we use we develop the many kind of uh, sub, uh, software algorithm for uh, mainstream medical doctor easily can use in their routine practice. So we combine this kind of automatic cleaning AI engine and the normative database. And finally, we we implemented the machine learning biomarker for the medical doctor detect early phase of the patient or select the med, uh, med, select the intervention design the intervention that kind of machine learning biomarker we developed uh, actively uh, one by one integrated in our software platform the the main target the main target first our target is the global dementia because there are many population uh, a baby boom, baby boom, baby boom generation increase. There are many big uh, market in there, so we first developed early screening biomarker, EEG based, the MCI. We developed MCI first, and then we want to develop the neuro precision neuropsychiatry, the designing right, designing the. Uh, 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 Design, uh, des designing the right neuromodulation neuro protocol or designing, uh, selecting the right medication is very important in psychiatric practice. So now we now develop the early prediction of the depression and we also make the quick summary report for all easily finding, selecting the medication. I can show you in, in, in next, uh, Another slide, and there is a the, we uh, we develop this kind of machine learning biomarker, and also we develop the digital therapeutics in the same device. Uh, there are uh, this kind of healthcare trend, the CV CV Insight. According to CV Insight, we we integrate this kind of all AI telehealth because our soft, our uh, is recording all the analysis is, is done on the cloud any place expert can review the data that makes the uh, client that, that make that makes the uh, telemedicine doctor can care the home news uh, home news patient and they can prescribe the neurotherapy at home they can easily review the data any, anywhere connected in the internet because all the patient data can be reviewed on the cloud. And that's basically, and on the, we have the dashboard, in, on the dashboard, the therapist and the patient can be together and can, a patient at home can get the supervision of the expert through, through the cloud platform. That's the, our tele, tele, telehealth platform. We uh, basically we are strong software company. Finally, we developed this device because the easy recording, easy quality recording is most important for easy, easy methodology dissemination. But there is no satisfy, satisfiable dry headset. We cannot find. Finally, we start to develop this device. So now we have the device, and uh, we specially target to the mental mental health. We integrate the digital therapeutics in this headset too. Uh, we don't use the omics data, but we now in collaborating uh, collaborating microbiome company in in health healthcare company because this uh, microbiome profile is very tight, closely correlate linked with our brain activity. So we now collaborate, in, we now integrating the microbiome instead of omics because uh, we, our dietary habit is very important for our immune, neuroimmune activity. 
So we're now integrating the microbiome except omics. Epigenetics is more important because, and we basically we are healthcare IT, health IT solution. Basically, uh, I'd like to briefly, current medical practice, uh, there is uh, some challenges current medical practice because EEG is very important tool. MRI is just a snapshot. You cannot, you cannot predict early, early, uh, earlier stage. fMRI is just a six second delayed oxygen concentration response. And PET imaging is just a, a kind of a pathology material imaging. So it, there is no real time, real time data, but, but EEG is uh, only real time data, a lot of information, but uh, EEG cannot be, cannot be used until now because it, recording is un, un, inconvenient. The many medical doctors don't get enough education in their uh, medical curriculum and there is no standardization in this field. So we want to make, we want to, we want to overcome this kind of challenge. So uh, we, we want to make this kind of quick assess, quick quality measurement device and also have the integrate, integration of the neuromodulation and neurofeedback in the same device. That we want to develop the telemedicine because pandemic, after the pandemic, many people and cannot come visit, it is very difficult to visit hospital. And also the neuromodulation should be 10 minutes a day at home. It is, it is very, very efficient one, but people don't need to go every time to hospital because home-based neuromodulation is very important. So we want to make this kind of uh, telemedicine device and neuromodulation device and assessment device at the same time. And another one is the standardization method. We, we made the uh, AI denoise, standardized AI denoising is quite uh, validated now. Uh, we use this device and uh, we, validate, we went through the validation study in Korea for uh, M our MCI, MCI classifier algorithm. Uh, we, have, uh, we originally had 90% accuracy for detecting normal as normal and detecting MCI as MCI. Using this device we, and combining with AI denoising, Recently, we, in the validation study, we, we get 80% accuracy. So our denoising algorithm, our dry easy quality is quite uh, uh, conventional, uh, conventional neurological practice for early detecting of the Alzheimer dimension, Alzheimer type MCI. So this kind of standard, standard, standard through this kind of standardization, Medical, conventional medical doctor easily adopt this kind of technology. And we further develop many kind of uh, clinician friendly quick summary report one by one. That's the depression early pre prediction and the brain developmental age quick summary report. I will show, I will briefly show you uh, later. And we also give the QEG guided personalized solution uh, and we we also we also have integration of the neuromodulation and neurofeedback and telemedicine telemedicine interface. I already mentioned. The, another important thing is this uh, treatment. Usually, neurofeedback is easily combined with this kind of easy head, easy headset. But the specialty of this device is the photobiomodulation. The photobiomodulation can uh, help many kind of disease, Al uh, Alzheimer's dementia, Alzheimer disease dementia, MCI, depression, and stroke, and TBI. Many kind of neuroinflammation disease can be reversed using this kind of uh, photobiomodulation. That's the, another one of, that's the specialty compared to the TMS, TDCS, like neuromodulation, because photobiomodulation, the 
priming the anti-inflammatory microglia. So this pot, pot, photon vessel is a special, uh, special function on the activating of neuroimmune function on the brain. So many kind of neuroinflammatory disease can, uh, we can take advantage of photobiomodulation. That's the slightly different other, other uh, neuromodulation. And I'd like to uh, uh, stress the, the, this developmental uh, disorder in child and adolescent, autistic, autist child, ADHD, they cannot control their dietary behavior normally. Their microbiome is very, very bad, profile is very bad. The brain, through the brain gut axis, they are uh, basically inflammatory. They, many, many uh, developmental disorder have the uh, inflammation in their brain is cross related. So I think the combining the photobiomodulation sometimes with another current, current stimulation, magnetic stimulation, combining the any kind, various kind of neuromodulation can help a lot in even in this uh, child and adolescent uh, developmental disorder field. Our core technology is the, this kind of innovative easy helmet, uh, quite good quality signal we can easily get. And another one is uh, automatic denoising. Another one is the normative database. It took eight years, only one database, sex classified data, only one database, first ever sex classified database. And we we still developing the many kind of AI biomarker. That's our core technology. And after we measure the data, the data uh, automatically went to go through the uh, cloud. There is, there is a normative database, AI automatic uh, analysis pipeline. And we also collect the pulse data. Using the pulse data, we can view the central nervous system, autonomic nervous, integrated nervous system at the same time. And we can, we can, uh, in, implement many kinds of machine learning biomarker to post psych psychiatrists, neurologists easily use this kind of quick report to in their routine practice. That's why we developed the machine learning biomarker to spread this kind of QE technology in mainstream medical practice. And another important thing is the photobiomodulation and neuro neurofeedback device. That's that's the, our uh, uh, platform services. I will uh, demo the, our device. This, this is, I already explained, the recording, Bluetooth communication, and then Wi-Fi data went through the cloud and all the analysis, AI analysis, AI denoising, DOM comparison, many kinds of biomarker analysis in, uh, in the cloud. And then the quick summary result for supporting the clinician decision of early detection, the designing the intervention, that kind of information is uh, going through the application just in five minutes after the recording. That's our software uh, mental health platform. There are many detailed uh, specifications here. The, I, I'd like to stress uh, one thing, this is the uh, this device is uh, uh, measurable for head components over 50 centimeters. For usually AEG under six, we can record this. AEG over six, we can record their EEG with, with high quality level, but under five years old, we cannot record because this device is too big. So now we are developing the small cap, the uh, AEG under five years old, the very light and very comfortable, and we now uh, developing. So maybe the next April in the commercial market, for many kind of uh, pediatric neurologists can use our device for recording age under five years old. Yeah. There is uh, many kind of detail uh, in information. I I put our specification of the device on the table in, on the, in the entrance. So 
if you have any interest, pick the specific uh, specification on the table. And one of major specialty is this kind of automatic 1020 positioning. We use a lot of source level analysis. So the correct uh, 1020 international standard positioning of the recording is very important. We uh, develop this device uh, when it fitting any kind of head shape and also maintaining the 1020 standardized location. So it, in this device, there are many kind of spring and gear structure maintaining the 1020 positioning, standard positioning. That's the specialty of mechanical design. And this is the software analysis part, basically automatic denoising, pre-processing, and we analysis sensor and source level and normative comparison. Finally, we have the profile just in user. And then we have this, this kind of simple quick, quick summary report. If some people have, have this kind of underactive area, we can target this underactive area using the neuro modulation, the neuro therapy technique. And the psychiatrist, for example, can, can, uh, can prescribe the activation medication. Some people has the blue area, overactive pattern, then psychiatrist can uh, prescribe the calming medication. In, on, until now, EEG is very, uh, has a lot of noise. It, it takes a lot of time to make a clean EEG, and there is no standard, standardized uh, automatic method. So psychiatrist cannot use the, this kind of QEG profile for designing the medication. But now, at now we have the quick recording device, standardized analysis, analysis is possible. This patient has overactive type, underactive, underactive type very easily. So they can easily adopt this kind of technology in routine psychiatric practice. And Yes, that's why, that's why we developed this kind of quick summary, reliable quick summary for mainstream medical practice. And uh, for the neurologist, we developed this, this one, early detection of the uh, MCI, bio, MCI mild cognitive impairment is very, very early stage of the dementia. We, if we detect the MCI status very early, then we can solve the many kind of global dementia burden. So, but neurologist, uh, it takes about two hours usually to determine the MCI, uh, to, to determine the MCI. They, they also have to, uh, uh, rec they also need the MRI data and there are many data they need, but using the MRI scan, the cognitive test, two hours cognitive test, combining that kind of uh, di disease di diagnosis information, we labeled all the EEG data coming from the expert neurologist, and we training our machine learning algorithm to detect MCI correctly. The, that's why we developed this kind of uh, machine learning biomarker. The first uh, MCI, First machine learning biomarker for neurologist, the accuracy is around 80%, and using this device, around 80%. That's the, the second device, a uh, second machine learning algorithm, software device, is the differentiating Lewy body from the Alzheimer. That, that will be uh, actively developed now on the clinical study. After the clinical study, we implemented as a Lewy body Dementia type is very uh, dangerous, very rapidly uh, progressing. So we can differentiate through the EEG. That is also very useful. Good. And this is our common uh, machine learning biomarker process. We gather, gather the specific uh, homogeneous disease group data from the uh, label data from the hospital, and we uh, when we uh, collected the, all the pictures from that data, usually uh, 
30,000 data from one, 30,000 pictures from one EEG data. We collected the labeled the data set of the specific disease and we trained the machine learning, machine learning model like this. So selected picture is uh, go through the uh, primary classification, classification. We finally, we have the good model and find, evaluated after evaluation, we finally have the best model. That, that kind of uh, com conventional process, we developed many kind of machine learning biomarker one by one and implemented our software platform. Another important thing is the brain age biomarker. Using around uh, 100 uh, QEG pictures, we can exactly predict the uh, uh, child and adolescent brain age in each brain row. So it is very important important one, I think. For example, this is a 12-year-old ADHD. He has a frontal theta excess or frontal alpha excess and view rhythm, and basically a frontal slow wave dominant type ADHD. In this case, the, we have this kind of frontal, frontal brain age is very lower than his biological age. After the, during the intervention, based on his QEG profile, we can, uh, we can monitor this kind of age development, age development during the intervention. That's uh, brain age. And we can also use this kind of brain age solution to targeted personalized uh, education. For example, some people, some children has a very low profile in, in a left parietal area, then we can target, we can design the specific education program that activating that kind of uh, area, for example, and then we can monitor the progress using this simple device and analysis. And we also uh, ch check the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system is very important. It, it is tightly linked with our central nervous system. During the 19 channel EEG recording, we also record one pulse one, one channel pulse monitoring. Using the pulse monitoring, we can find the sympathetic activity and vagal activity, parasympathetic activity at the same time. Using that activity pattern, we can design some people vagal activation for some stressful population, PTSD and addiction population, for example, uh, tra trauma population. We can find that they are, for example, like this. After the uh, pulse, we can get this kind of result. After the pulse, after the measurement, this is the autonomic balance, sympathetic balance. And we also have the, their kind, this kind of stress, stress uh, stage. We can identify the, space, the patient has uh, which, uh, located in which stage. This is the general, Based general auditive syndrome based model. And you can also detect the uh, emotion problem like this. The most important uh, specialty is uh, photobiomodulation. I already mentioned. Nowadays, many uh, uh, spot, basically, photobiomodulation starts, research starts from the acute phase stroke rehabilitation. Acupage emergency room, there are a stroke, acupage, acupage stroke patient, the photobiomodulation in the stroke area, uh, the, the efficacy comes from that kind of stroke study. And then uh, the next evidence coming from the established in the traumatic brain injury. Nowadays, many football player, many sports conclusion team want to have this kind of device because in, in, there, in many uh, sports conclusion case, there are many cognitive issues in their brain. They want to have a rehabilitation. The, the photobiomodulation is the special, special performance in recovering the cognitive issue coming from the traumatic brain injury. So many uh, sports team want to have this kind of photobiomodulation device. We now collaborating some, uh, uh, some neurologists carrying the sports team in, in US. That's the uh, very promising uh, neuromodulation method.
and also it in, in, enhance the, as, as I already mentioned, the child and adolescent ha has very bad gut activity. So that kind of uh, this brain gut axis. So the inflammatory neural inflammation can be debuffed using this uh, photobiomodulation tool. I want to have one volunteer from the floor, and I'd like to show you the. Yes. Uh, there are some today. Yes. Shall we get some questions? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Why don't you prepare it? Yes. Public bit. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. So it's not extendable device. It's always connected to the internet. Do you need Wi-Fi connection? Yes. Wi-Fi connection. Basically, all the data goes through the cloud. So basically, Wi-Fi connection is. Yes. 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 Yeah, I'm not going to allow any data. Ah, I see. Yeah, just, I see. Yeah. 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 Uh, the same problem actually all around. Uh, all yeah, yeah, yeah. The information yeah. about their fever. I see. Yeah. To themselves. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just asking about like that. Yeah. We can make the the we can make the uh, not Wi-Fi. We can make the uh, wired connection too. But oh, yes, yes, that is uh, possible basically. But so cloud solution basically all the data is anonymized first and encrypted and uh, stored in secured place. So we cannot hack the data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the cyber security of the current medical system. Yeah. Yeah. It's more about like ethical AI. I think you already. Yeah. Which cloud cloud platform do you use for? Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. AWS. AWS. Yes. And you got some AI. Yeah. All cloud 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 of cyber AI and ethics standards. Yeah. And that's why they have to obey the yeah. 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 Cyber security, security criteria is really high nowadays, yeah. especially in the medical field. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Any other questions? No questions? Why you are pressing our window? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you, you, you guys need deep learning patterns? Yeah. Uh, do you, can you do scan, do you monitor your treatment as well? Do you monitor your electric treatment as well? Treatment as well. Do you monitor, like, you, you do scan patient claim and you do some lab therapy as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So at least, do you, do you record that as well, like in terms of yeah, yeah. improvement? Yeah, treatment is recorded, treatment history is recorded, well, and the monitoring right. is possible. Maybe, maybe using reinforcement learning. Um, our words and made some statistic comparisons for, for that one, but mm -hmm. um, we applied it and um, classification. Yeah, yeah, we haven't done uh, deep learning. Anything. Okay, yeah. all right, because like we have to read in learning is basically how we can learn from itself and then it's going to go, it's technology itself. Okay, okay.
Hi, I'm just wondering, um, as we know, we speak about most of the time the effective ways, and uh, I was wondering whether you are planning to implement automated spike detection in your system. Um, we, uh, yeah, we are now uh, collaborating with the uh, uh, pediatric neurologist for carrying the development issue of the epilepsy patient. So we now collecting phase of the data. So at the moment, we don't have spike detection and machine learning algorithm for that, but we are now uh, collab data collection status of the collaboration. So, yeah, it will be, it will be. Any other questions? Can I start just giving the demo? Yes. Can I touch you? Okay. Okay. You can tell him to hold it in a way. Actually, this is the dry recording, but we need preparation of ground and reference area because the quality. Yeah, yeah. Only these two areas. Enable, excuse me, enable. 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 She has called it. She pressed it. The after device connection, we have to check the impedance in each 18 electrode. Impedance check. Sorry? Yes. Warranty. Warranty. One year. One year. For the patient. No guarantees. Okay. Huh? Uh, okay. The green and yellow usually means good impedance, and red is not a good impedance usually. But impedance value is the instantaneous value. So we have to check the usually decrease the impedance. We usually take off the hair and try to get connect the white area, the same silver, silver colorized material, contact the skull. That's, that's the only thing we usually have, have to do. But in this case, the, this area, quite good contact as far as we see. But it is not. Yeah. 
And when the impedance doesn't drop, we use this kind of vibration button. The vibration button is slightly moving the hair area to make a good contact of the silver, silver coating material to touch the, the skin, sculpt skin, sculpt skin, like this. One more time. Computer. Uh, okay. And we can check the signal check. We can check the signal, but the people is not so good. At it. It's I think. But after checking the signal, we can start the recording usually. But as far as I know, as far as I, my experience, the people signal is a little bit more, uh, we can make the more good signal. I, I have to try once more. Because uh, basically dry, dry, uh, is kind of a mechanical contact, not a chemical contact. The su uh, su suitable amount of pressure should be maintained during the recording. That's the important thing. The, the one electrode shows red. I think it will be now more reliable than before. So we can start the routine recording, two minutes eyes closed and two minutes eyes open. Then we can get the normative comparison result to find the underactive or overactive area. And also we can get the MCI early screening result. And we can also get the autonomic nervous system stress profile at the same time. Even just after five minutes, finishing the recording. There is a temporal muscle. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ah. Different purpose. Uh, because we're just trying yeah. to collect um, ice flow paper. Yeah. Uh, screening of other things. That's what we can do. 
we already uh, we, we always recommend the uh, ease expert or clinician to review the clean data before 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 using the quick summary because reviewing, reviewing the clean data they can find uh, in uh, in specific case auto, uh, epileptic spike can be removed during the automatic denoising you can the clinician can easily review the clean data and the dissected component so yes we some yes yeah 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 in in the in in, in the dashboard you can find the raw data and clean data and dissected data you can easily find after checking the the denoising process on on the dashboard you can try you can use the all the quick summary result even sometimes the automatic denoising is not perfect you can manually edit the denoising to make the reliable report quick report <laughs> Do you want to try photobiomodulation? modulation? Yeah, yeah. scan <laughs> During five minutes recording, uh, five minutes analysis process, we test, we, we uh, apply the photobiomodulation modulation for him. Uh, if you want to test the <laughs> yes. So are you going to find the requirements that are needed to do the biomodulation? Yes. Okay. Usually the Usually QEG profile shows a very slow wave dominant type. We, we uh, apply the 40 hertz high frequency photobiomodulation. And during waiting time, do you apply that? Like yeah. For five minutes? Okay. yeah. Uh, the infrared light, uh, capture light there for five. Select high, near, and also middle choose your music. Okay. Uh, how many hertz? ACDC. Uh, it's from 1 to 45. 45. You choose whatever uh, frequency. Will Small so 15 hertz is usually used for the long COVID patient. Long COVID patient, uh, brain fog, 
and the memory decline and the fatigue, we usually give the 15 hertz photobiomodulation five minutes a day. Yes. What? Long COVID? We have, uh, now we have anecdotal case from the many, I think we have device. But you can actually select any, any of the areas. Yes, that yes. Are yeah, yes. Yeah, we can target specific network, for example, autistic child. We can, we can uh, select the rep. Yes, and also and network. Yes. Yes. Fifteen hertz photobiomodulation usually very good for the uh, brain fog. No, no. <laughs> our our photobiomodulation has special structure because usual photobiomodulation cap. It's just, uh, just wearing a, like a hat. So there are many kinds of scattering. They, they just uh, slightly uh, wearing a hat. So many kinds of optical power is scattered by the hair. But in our case, we use the brush electrode in, in each of the, uh, in, in the center of the brush electrode, there is a LED wearing a headset, the brush, take away of hair and making a LED surface directly contact to the scalp, scalp skin. That the penetration and efficiency is very high. So five minutes is not a, not a long time, but efficacy is quite good because the, there is no scattering in the hair area in our device. The special brush electrode structure makes that. At, at the moment, there, it is not. Yeah, just one frequency, one uh, special location or special network activated at the same time. Usually, many neurofeedback practitioners use this kind of 15 hertz, 10 minute activation before the neurofeedback for neurofeedback efficacy. And actual, actual photobiomodulation yeah. for the beta access, beta spindle, they use the 10 hertz. And the slow wave dominant, they use 40 hertz, 45 hertz. That kind of selection protocol is now uh, clinically uh, uh, experimented now. Yes. <laughs> I want to show a port portal dashboard at the same time. There is a portal site here. The, the Wi-Fi speed depends on... <laughs>
Turkey and for Slow, huh? Yeah. The Wi Fi. Yeah. Yes, right. Very slow. Then, Thank you. Thank you. I can go. Yeah, this is your result. I replayed. Mm -hmm. Mm. All the application operation depends on Wi-Fi speed. All the data coming from the cloud, so it depends on yeah. yes, yes, speed of the speed of the internet. Yes, we have. <laughs> he, he has quite balanced profile, except the right frontal, right, right temporal area, uh, left temporal area, not right, left temporal area. Uh, right temporal. Right temporal. Right temporal. Okay. Yeah, you can see that is um, right and both side is a bit overactive in comparison to what the normal take place. Um, so we're comparing its data to a um, normative data that's of same sex and age, and uh, it shows that uh, maybe its EEG is um, overactive or underactive in comparison. And so it's right and both side is a bit overactive. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, all the balance except this right temporal area. But actually, we have to we have to review the clean data before reviewing this quick report. But the portal site portal site is uh, very difficult to connect at the moment. The Wi-Fi speed, but yes. So if you want the most accurate result, you should you know the data yourself and try coordinating it into that. Yeah, and that's just a good score of. People in a multi database. So if you go uh, if you go further away from the center, it means um, we're getting uh, away from the This is the right right temporal area. So it's away from the norm. Yeah. Yes. But as long as you don't get into a hyper zone, uh, we don't really consider it a big problem. So it's brain is absolutely fine, I guess. <laughs> 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 <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> Can you sign it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we also have a hard paper. Ah, this one I like. This yeah. one. Because yes. I use Vegas stimulator as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. So, yeah, you use stress stimulators. Very good heart rate. Very, very, very low. Yeah, yeah. yeah very low. Eight heart rate. Yes. Yeah. 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 I thought she was going to sleep that one. Excellent HLV. Heart rate is mean. Close to excellent. Distribution is quite excellent too. Why the distribution reflect the cardiac flexibility? Next. Oh, HLV, I'm going to talk about so this is a chance of you having an MCI or an image 
He has no cognitive issue, cognit cognitively very healthy. This so is the, okay? yeah. yes. So only the 50% is good. Yeah, healthy, healthy profile and the cognitive tra traject so. dementia trajectory, you are quite healthy. I have one HLB summary. HLB. Yeah, but straight to here. Yeah, this is his uh, stress profile, stress stage, stage analysis is quite good condition in this, this five different sta stress stage model. Another one. So we have worked with Kelsey. His, de <laughs> his 14. depression is normal, but he has a uh, little anxious. Yeah. <laughs> I have to check the temporal right temporal hyper, hyper arousal in more detail, just using one minute. Is somebody have a question? Is somebody detail or premium or something? This is the, his right temporal hyper arousal. We have to, to we have to more localized result. We, we can get more, more localized result in the below chart, go, go below. This is the, yes, just above. Yes, this, all the region has a kind of 90. Yes, all your regions yeah. are overactive. In the temporal yes. Yeah. See that, you're on the ninth seventh or ninth percentile. In this case, all the right temporal, uh, the ROI region has hyperarousal pattern, but in specific case, we can find the localized ROI, which ROI in which in, in the in the temporal law has the more issue. We can find the detailed analysis from here. Yes. yes. This is most deviant area in this case, the transverse temporal area. Uh, major function is the auditory, yes, auditory yeah. function. Yeah, 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 we have the 3D connection. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you also show? yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Wi-Fi speed, it depends on Wi-Fi oh, speed. Okay. Yeah. We, we, we can show the normative comparison result in the portal site. There are 3D animation of the individual analysis and normative comparison analysis. In the 3D connectivity pattern, yeah. if there is no abnormal connectivity in the normal comparison, there is no connection. But people has very abnormal connect, connection compared to the, to the normative database. In the 3D normative connectivity animation, there are a lot of connections we can find. Okay. Also, individual analysis before normative comparison, yeah, we can find the spe specific individual connect connection pattern we can find. Between the regions. So yes. Are, Some people have strong connection from frontal to emotion regulation area, for example. But we, we, we can do the same we can to review the same network pattern individually before normative comparison in 3D. Yeah. Yes. The reason why we have a problem is on both sides because. Can we see that also? Huh? Oh, yeah, we can't that. This is the analytic component analysis, and you can see that um, our automatic analytic pipeline didn't remove yeah. this noise because it has um, actual uh, the EG signal included in it, yes. but it still has um, the EMG component sets in this as well. So we can actually uh, manually denoise it again and remove this component and see what happens in terms of the result. Yeah, for doing that, you see that's really powerful. Yeah. And really powerful. It's all the pigs. Yeah. It's 10. He has two alpha peak here, 9.6 and around just above the 10 hertz. And, and according to uh, alpha peak? Uh, 10, 10 hertz, yes. Yeah, maybe it's a result. 
Thank you. But this is eyes close. Yes. But Three to seven of them is artifact. Eleven is This is the artifact. Yeah. We have to remove further. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. So no, no other people. The size of the nature. Yeah. I saw the expect the output. Yeah, we took the set off the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me just try uh, the noise in this again. Re-analysis. And you can select manual noise again. You can select try safety points. Yeah. Hold that. What you can, if you just do a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I think you're going to do it. All the people coming in. <laughs> yes, we are. Well, we had a few months. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, please. <laughs> so he can he, he, he go back and do something. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just processing it. Yes. So because in. In season, but we still need some yeah. understanding of qualification to be able to do Yes. That. I'm, I'm sensitive that she was asking me. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. How sensitive are the algorithms to race and ethnicity? Race the uh, and ethnicity, ethnicity, yeah, 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 very good question. Uh, we are uh, basically there are many, uh, there could be a difference between the western and eastern, yes. for, for example, yes, but there are many study the, the easy database is culture free, basically, okay, but in. According to our study, there is a little difference. Yes. Yeah, but, I think so also. Yes. But male and female difference is more okay. substantial. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's why we di differentiate our data database male and female. Right. So, uh, yes. that's, You can have a look at all the selected uh, ICA components, and you can choose the uh, smallest component itself. Yeah. You can choose one. So that's the smallest component. Is part of the other. So you can choose. Yeah. Yeah. So this is then. Uh, you can do many. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
can you also manually uh, delete some parts of the feature? Yeah, sure, sure. It's also yeah, it's also possible. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I've just removed that component three, which was like, causing a problem. Uh, if you agree, I'm not, uh, yeah. In the post -pro -pro processing, you can detect the noise epoch too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Not very yeah. Muscle yeah. Muscle yeah. Muscle. yeah. 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 Tissue, tissue, slightly. We we need more, more, more. We need more clean recording. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One question. Uh, usually, when we do <coughs> our patients, they are lying down. Yeah. And it's a standard protocol. Yeah. 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 Uh, how this is Is it going to affect the condition? Yeah. 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 Yes. Maybe the the posterior area, the contact pressure is a little bit little bit decreased. So I cannot. Uh, you haven't tried. Yeah. You haven't tried. Yeah. So yeah. I think what happened because of the pressure. The pressure is going to change. Yeah. 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 You come to the sleep one. Can you do? You come to the sleep. Sleep easy. Yeah. Yeah. Can you know? Yeah, I, no. I think no. Because no. if it touches logically, it's going yeah. to change. No, yeah. not, because, not because of the face. It's uncomfortable. Yes. 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 We can increase the time, recording time, but, uh -huh. but, uh, but uh, yes. I also think that it's just because it's shown maybe it's actually. Yes. During the sleep, there is a lot of uh, head movement and there is a lot of noise, maybe. So it's it is the, the right now uh, with movement, like with real situation. Yeah. Like, for example, in court profession, they yeah, yeah. put helmet, that's why they try also to try and yeah. and then they go to the bicycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All this that's also challenging. Yeah. Yes, yeah. challenging. It, it is good for the routine resting state the uh, yes sitting position that's the best yeah. best quality yeah. yes oh, wait, wait. Is going to show the 3d yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that's the 3D. Yeah. It, it's with someone else. Uh, uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh.
It takes too much time to retrieve the 3D information. Yes, here is. So this is a three data. Um, it's this show with an absolute power um, that's been calculated through a uh, Tesla uh, uh, And this is absolute power. Yeah. Uh, can you be able to check the relative power? Yes, yes. Um, it's the relative power here. That's going to take a while again. Yes. Uh, okay. And you can also check connectivity uh, between the source, uh, localization sources. Yeah, so the relative power, the same data. Okay. And I can spin you around. Right. And then there's also some, yeah. something yeah. parallel. Yeah. 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 I can choose if you want to uh, just to do the left side of the brain or the right side of the brain. <laughs> That's just the right side. So we can review the medial side of the brain activity. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th